All right, this is uh, from the, s wait, from the Curse Candy Mysteries series, and it is the first novel, which is Cutthroat Cupcakes. Um, and I, I normally read um, at least part of my stories out loud to myself, so I'm reading this out loud as part of the editing process. What that means is um, it's raw and unedited just for you. Uh, also, I've had a half a glass of wine, so this should be good times. Uh, chapter one. I didn't profile my guests. Not exactly. But on days when I wasn't swamped with in-store shoppers and filling online orders, I like to guess at the motivations of the people who entered my shop. Every type of person came into Sticky Tricky Treats, my year-round Halloween-themed candy store. Not an exaggeration because everyone either loved sweets or knew someone who loved sweets. And since I offered the best specialty handcrafted candies in town, I saw the sweet tooth regulars, the occasional shoppers, the apology gift buyers, and the seasonal crowd. The past hour or so had been a lull with online orders that didn't need to go out until tomorrow and only a customer or two in the store at a time. So I'd been entertaining myself playing the why candy, why today game. There'd been the harried mother of three who just needed a little something special for herself on a tough day. The kids had been absent, likely in school, but something about the large purse and comfortable clothes said busy mom, and the tired look in her eyes spoke volumes as to the type of day she'd been experiencing. I placed a handful of lavender lemon drops as an extra surprise for her inside her bag. Then there was the PMSing 30-something, well aware that sugar would give her a happy high for the moment, but, she, <laughs> but that she'd be suffering for the indulgence later. <clears throat> Memphis, no. I slipped a tiny packet of dark chocolate-covered almonds and hazelnuts into her bag. If she didn't like nuts or dark chocolate, so be it. But she'd probably feel slightly less terrible after eating them as a snack than she would after eating the milk chocolate caramels with sea salt. No judgment, though. I loved those salty sweet candies during certain times of the month myself. A few others passed through my shop, and I gave each of them my best effort. I was fairly confident in my guesses. Sussing out shoppers' motivations was one of my superpowers. I looked at a customer, focused on what they needed, and poof, their candy motivation popped into my head. If they didn't come to my checkout counter with the candy I thought they needed, I slipped a little something extra into their bag. I could afford it. The shop had been on solid ground for about three years now, and it made me happy to give my guests a little something to make their day better. Occasionally, a lone shopper whose candy motivation eluded me would cross my threshold. Today was one of those rare instances. I surreptitiously studied the man whose motivation would not be named. Still, nothing poofed into my head. Tall, solidly built, scruffy jawed, with dirty blonde hair and a good sprinkling of gray in his short beard. There was nothing about him that would, that should, there was nothing about him that should have prevented me from making a good guess. It was possible I was distracted by his level eight hotness, but I'd had the occasional nine come into the store and still managed to pinpoint their candy motivation. He walked through my small shop, examining each display. He paused in the sugar cupcake topper section, scrutinizing the pumpkin tops. They weren't my favorite item. Once they were gone, I wasn't planning to make more. The idea had been for them to look like the sliced off top of a pumpkin, like a pumpkin hat. The result wasn't entirely up to my standard, and I'd been in a bit of a mood when I'd been working on them. My ex had sent me a stream of less than friendly text messages that evening. Not those poor pumpkin toppers fault, but the product had been forever tainted in my mind. Level 8 didn't pick up the pumpkin toppers. Rather, he continued his perusal of my wares, stopping only once more to give my candy sticks a thorough gander. Another non-favorite of mine, or at least the orangey-brown ones were. The evening I'd made them, I'd been a bit peeved about some offensive behavior perpetrated upon my innocent lawn. My friend Betty, who happened to live a few houses away, had sent me a video evidence of my least favorite neighbor blowing leaves into my yard. Level 8, with his unknown candy motivation, toured my entire stock of treats and happened to land on two of my least favorite candies, both made when I'd been in a particularly poor mood. Oops, typo. I didn't have a lot of foul moods, so, tr so they truly were standout items in my shop. And then he headed to the exit. I was about to be offended. Not many people entered Sticky Tricky Treats without purchasing at least one small goodie. When he paused at the door and flipped the sign to closed. Excuse me, the words flew from my mouth before I'd considered the danger factor. 
A man had just isolated me in my own shop. That could not be good. I slid my hand casually to my rear jeans pocket where I'd stashed my cell phone. He paused, as if surprised by my objection. The sugar pumpkins and the candy sticks are for sale. Uh, there's a question mark there. The sugar pumpkins and the candy sticks um, are for sale? What? No, I put them on the shelves with price tags for fun. But I didn't voice my inappropriate thought. Instead, I replied calmly, yes, all of the candy on the shelves is for sale. Then again, I did give my customers little extras at no charge. So I added, though I do sometimes give samples. Candy for sale and for sample. Shocker, since this was a candy shop. As evidenced by the sign on the door and all of the candy. Sophia Emmeline Dorchester, you are under arrest for the illegal sale and distribution of cursed candy. Oddly, it wasn't the cursed part of his impossible statement that first struck me, or even the arrested part. It was the odd inflection in Level 8's speech. I thought he might possibly be German, though his English was practically native. Then I realized some strange, possibly German man was attempting to arrest me. And then I realized he'd accused me of selling cursed candy. Clearly, a crazy person was having a break with reality inside my candy store. Oh my God. And that crazy person was flipping the lock on my shop door. That's the end of chapter one. Okay, this is chapter two from Cutthroat Cupcakes, uh, the, let's see, Cursed Candy Mysteries series. And uh, like with chapter one, raw and unedited, uh, meaning I'm going to actually be editing some of this as I go. I was going to die, murdered in my favorite place in the whole world, surrounded by my lovingly crafted candies, with the exception of the pumpkin toppers and the candy sticks, naturally. 37 years old, never married, and no kids. I'd never even been to Canada. I'd lived in Idaho for five years, and I'd never been to Canada. I meant to go. I'd even planned a trip across, across the country, starting in Vancouver and making my way west until I landed in Montreal. Two weeks, three if I made a few stops. I'd planned to write and enjoy the scenery and write some more. Maybe, hopefully, finish the book I'd started before I opened Sticky Tricky Treats. Except I didn't really write much these days. Who had the time? And three-week-long trips were prohibitively expensive. And then there was the question, did I go by myself, bring a friend, try to find a date? But that was all moot because a crazy man came into my shop. He was going to murder me dead. I wouldn't be around anymore, and I definitely wouldn't be going to Canada. He headed toward me, but his path veered, and he landed once again in front of the candy sticks. He removed a pair of gloves from a pocket dark black like the ones my colorist used when she bleached and dyed my hair. Then, gloved up, he gathered my orangey-brown candy sticks and deposited them on the counter in front of me. Next, he retrieved the pumpkin cupcake toppers and placed them next to the candy sticks. A bag, he asked, and then had the gall to look at me as if I'd produce one for him. When I failed to comply, he leaned over the counter and grabbed one himself. As he leaned forward, I leaned back. An ounce of self-preservation kicking in, perhaps. He stuffed the offending candy into the purloined bag. Do you have an employee you can call to cover for you? I didn't have a clue where he was going with that because as soon as he said call, I remembered my phone. The fingertips of my right hand were still touching it. Hmm? I said as I slipped my phone from my back pocket. Oh, I think you missed a few orange candy sticks. I tipped my head in the direction of the candy stick display, away from me. I got them all. Level 8 crossed his arms. Your phone won't work. Mm. and I thought I'd been subtle. Wait, my phone wouldn't work. Right. This from the guy who accused me of cursing my candy, so he probably thought he put it... He probably thought... Typo. He probably thought he'd put a spell on my phone, and hocus pocus, abracadabra, he was going to prevent me from calling. But if he thought that was true, then maybe he wouldn't lose his bananas at first sight of my phone. I lifted it and dialed 911 like my life depended on it or I tried to. A solid black screen greeted my frantic efforts. The crazy man had not abracadabbered my phone dead. He hadn't. I must have forgotten to charge it last night. I inched closer to the phone next to the register. Yes, my store had a, my store had a landline. 
And as much as I begrudged that bill each month, right now I was doing a little dance of the fact that I had another way to reach out for help. Level 8 arched his eyebrows. Go ahead. Try it. Dead. Just like I was going to be because I was trapped in my candy shop with a murdery wizard. Or a guy who planned really well. Taking out both of my phones would definitely have required a lot of planning. Ugh. I'd almost prefer a murdery wizard to someone who plotted my takedown with such meticulous care. Okay, I'm super confused right now. I should call someone to cover for me, but not really, because my saw is dead and you've cut my landline somehow. He retrieved a cell from his cargo pants. Yeah, he'd woken up this morning and had a moment when he looked in his closet and thought that cargo pants were a good choice. And yet, I still found him attractive. Maybe he was an 8.5 level hotness since I'd initially looked right past those tragic pants. He lifted the phone. You have someone you can call? Strange man with a fake badge who was stealing my candy and had locked me inside my own store, wanted me to take his phone and call an available employee, which I did not have, so that my store could remain open while he murder kidnapped me. Um, I was having a hard time fitting everything that was happening right now into my brain and making it come together in a way that made sense. An employee, he prompted once more as he jiggled the phone in his hand. I've only got one part-timer, and she's got midterms right now. He shrugged, as if that was just fine with him. It probably was, since he could murder kidnap me even more easily without an employee wondering why they'd been called in last minute. You'll have to close the shop, then. Since he'd already done that when he flipped my sign to closed and locked the door, what was I supposed to say? Except I was feeling contrary, so I said, no. Because, no. I would not be complicit in my own kidnapping, and since this wacko had yet to pull some kind of weapon out of one of those mini pockets of his, I was calling his bluff. He frowned as if my behavior confused him. My behavior. Me. The same person who refused to be complicit in her own fake arrest. Except I wasn't entirely sane because I'd accidentally refused the use of his phone, which I could have used to call for help. I'd smack my head, but at this rate, I wasn't entirely sure I wouldn't give myself a concussion. That was just the kind of day this was turning into. Before we leave, I need to see your logbook. When I stared at him in confusion because, what logbook? He said, your logbook? Where you record the names and contact information for the... Come on, word. Sorry. Here we go. Your logbook? Where you record the names and contact information for the recipients of magical items. Okay. First, I was skipping the issue of magical items. I don't curse candy, and I don't sell magical items. Just because my candy store was Halloween-themed, that didn't mean I believed in ghosts, witches, and warlocks. But this guy apparently believed in all the magical things, and I wasn't about to tip his worldview off its axis right now, if I even could. As for the logbook, you're kidding me, right? I flashed him an incredulous scowl. We're not selling guns in here, mister. Bastion. Sorry? Bastian Heisman, regional representative for the International Criminal Witch Police. He pulled a wallet from yet another pocket. How many pockets did those terrible pants have? His wallet contained a shiny badge that he was now displaying with a great deal of confidence. Did delusional people have props? This was news to me. I'd never been cornered and locked in my shop by a lunatic intent on arresting me for made-up charges. Then again, he had done enough prep to take out my cell and landline, so a fake badge fit in nicely with his careful planning. I want to see your badge. Mostly because I wanted to mess with him just a little bit. My risk taker side popped up at the most inconvenient of times. He handed it over without hesitation. Freakishly, it looked and felt real. Solid. I'd expected something like a child's Wild West tin badge, I guess. It even had interna International Criminal Witch Police stamped on it. And since I had his wallet in my hand, I flipped through it. I'd been right about his slight accent. He had a German identity card in his wallet, as well as an Idaho driver's license. There were also a few credit cards. Each card has it had his name, Bastian Heisman, printed on it. I returned it and then held my hand, held out my hand, palm up. Your phone. No. Worth a try. I leaned on the counter. You know you're going to jail. Prison. Jail is a temporary holding facility where convicted criminals sentenced to a term less than one year serve their time. He sounded a little like a cop or a guy who knew cop-like stuff. So you're saying you recognize that what you're doing is illegal and that it's serious enough to warrant a longer sentence. He sighed. I don't have time for this. Are you familiar with the International Witch and Warlock Code of Conduct? No. No, I am not. Honesty seemed like the best policy. I wasn't denying the existence of magic or anything, just knowledge of some fictional rule book with fake rules that Bastion seemed to think I'd violated. 
My response didn't elicit a sigh this time. Rather than annoyed, frustrated, and generally impatient, now he looked concerned. Who was your mentor? Um, Kat helped me set up my books. Betty, my super cool elderly neighbor, she helps with taste testing. Oh, and Brian, I wrinkled my nose because even saying his name made me want to scream or eat a lot of milk chocolate caramel with sea salt. My ex, Brian, helped with, no, your witch mentor. And here it was, what I'd been trying to avoid. No witch, no witch mentor, Bastion, because I'm not a witch. Because witches aren't actually real. I waved at the Halloween decor in my shop, which is ghosts and vampires inclusive, and said, not real, any of it. A determined light sparked in his eyes, and then he whipped out a pair of handcuffs from one of his gazillion pockets. Yet another reason to hate those pants. Wait, handcuffs? No, no, no. Except yes, Bastion Heisman, regional rep of some imaginary witch squad, was snapping handcuffs on me. How would that happen so fast? You can't arrest me for, for whatever you're arresting me for. I couldn't have an arrest record. I was no criminal. No. No, that was wrong. So wrong. I would not be brainwashed by the crazy man. This wasn't about being arrested. You're definitely going to murder kidnap me now, aren't you? The counter still separated us, which made Bastion's cuffing skills freakishly good. I really couldn't recall exactly how the cuffs had gone from his hands to around my wrists. Then he pulled out his cell and made a phone call. I need transport. I'm not getting in your murder van. Pretty sure I screeched that loud enough for whoever was on the other end of the line to hear it. Yeah, give me five second delay. Bastion tucked away his phone on one of, in one of his various pockets, grabbed his bag of purloined candy with one hand, and then leaned further across the counter to grab my upper arm with the other. Then everything went black. End of the chapter. So tonight is chapter three from the Cursed Candy Mysteries, uh, the first book in the series, which is Cutthroat Cupcakes. And this chapter is a little bit longer than the earlier ones. It's, you know, normal Kate length, but it's a little longer than the earlier one. So I'm definitely um, consuming an adult beverage while reading this. So if there are stops and starts, that would be why. Uh, and in case you're wondering and you would like to share as you listen, um, I'm drinking a cider Manhattan, which is really good. Okay. Um, was that I inhaled coffee? And not the over-roasted, half-burnt variety. The aroma surrounded me. I inhaled again because I loved the smell of coffee. I was next only to the smell of baking bread and my inventory of favorite food scents. And yes, I was a confectioner who loved the smell of baked goods above candy. I possessed a number of odd quirks, and that particular preference didn't come near to top in the list. I think she's awake. The voice sounded worried, and male, and young. She's definitely awake. This came from a woman. Also young, but much less worried. Sophia, that voice I recognized, my abductor, Bastian Heisman. I groaned, no one called me Sophia except my great aunt, and that was only because I was named after her. I suspected her persistence indicated an inflated ego more than a failing memory. Well, looks like you might have maimed this one, the woman said. No way, the young man replied. I'm careful, I'm always careful. Huh, I didn't feel maimed, I felt... Okay, probably. Pretty sure I was reclining on a sofa and opening my eyes seemed like a lot of effort, but otherwise no obvious complaints. On the plus side, I wasn't cuffed. I was fairly sure I'd been cuffed earlier. Cuffed or not, maimed or not, I couldn't hang out all evening, all evening long listening. Typo. I couldn't hang out all evening listening to people I didn't know talk about me. With a concerted effort, I willed my eyes open to find that I was, as I'd predicted, lying on a sofa. Since the view of the ceiling didn't reveal much, I moved to sit up. Bad choice. Very bad. My head exploded with pain before I got a look at the worried guy or the flippant woman. Bastion loomed over me and put his hand on my shoulder. Take it easy. As if he needed to hold me there or tell me not to move. Please. I wasn't going anywhere in a hurry. I disliked pain intensely. The woman sniggered. Told you. Maimed. I'm not maimed, I whispered, but I do feel like a bag of jawbreakers knocked me on the head. That's weirdly specific, the woman said. Not really. I'm a candy maker, and I've had a bag of jawbreakers dropped on my head. 
I slowly shifted toward the group, but couldn't help a small moan. I can fix that for you if you like, the woman said. Both Bastion and the worried young man said no before I had the chance to say yes and ask how quickly. I'll fix it, Bastion said. Uh, I think you dropped the jawbreakers. He looked confused, or maybe as if he was translating in his head. Odd, because his English was exceptional. And then he said, I didn't hit you, not with a bag of jawbreakers or anything else. You didn't handle the transport very well. Transport. Wait a second. I'd been in my shop. Bastion had phoned someone requesting transport, and then he'd grabbed my arm. That was all I could remember. Did you drug me? The woman, a short, curvy 20-something with dark brown, almost black hair, and a perfectly executed bold red lip, said, no, he didn't drug you. That's not Bastion's style. Poisons and potions seem like they'd be more up your alley. Seriously, with the cursed candy garbage again? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't curse my candy. Yeah, except you did. The brunette rolled her eyes. You made the candy, and the candy is cursed. Or go, you cursed the candy. What's your name? I really wanted a name to put that up to put with that obnoxious attitude and red lipstick. Here we go, the warrior muttered. He was average height, dark headed, with just, just enough facial hair to be interesting. His age was difficult to determine because even with the facial hair, he had a youthful look. Sorry, typo. When I say typo, I'm actually changing the wording because it sounds weird to me, which is why I'm reading it out loud, which is why you guys are getting these excerpts. Okay. The brunette glared at him, at me, at the world in general. Sabrina. If I was reading the situation correctly, the three people locked in this aromatic room with me right now believed they were witches. The whole international criminal witch police shtick pointed to that conclusion. And now Sabrina, the witch. I swallowed a laugh because one, inappropriate, and two, laughter was guaranteed to make my head explode. Sabrina, with her black hair, bright red lipstick, and plunging cleavage, looked nothing like the wholesome blonde from the TV show of my childhood. And yet, I couldn't help but pair the two. Not a single word. Don't say it. Don't, but I couldn't help myself. Sabrina the Teenage Witch? I pressed my lips together because laughter equaled pain. Also, I doubted that any verbal expression of humor would be tolerated by Sabrina the Not Teenage Witch. Shame on me for pushing her buttons. I really shouldn't antagonize her. A short lady is needed to stick together. Also, she seemed like a terrible friend, but an even worse enemy. You done, she asked. I started to nod, then thought better of it, given the pain that was waiting to explode in my head, and said, yeah, sorry, it was a compulsion, you know? Yeah, ever since that remake came out, she squinted at the look on my face. The new one has a horror vibe. I hadn't a clue what she was talking about. She rolled her eyes. Never mind. Can I fix you now, Bastion asked. If you can make the second worst headache I've ever experienced disappear, then yes, please fix me. Bastion knelt next to me, and I got a whiff of him. He smelled like cardamom and ginger and cinnamon and a hint of citrus and Sophia, he asked, with more than a hint of annoyance in his tone. Ooh. There we go. Fix that. Okay. Huh? My name's Lena. I don't go by Sophia. And I would not sniff him, even if he did smell like the yummiest man I'd ever smelled. He'd gone from level eight and a half to 11. How was I supposed to think around an 11? Great. Lena, can I start? His hand was inches from my head. Sure, yeah, do your thing. Maybe he'd magic, magic finger massage my pain away. Assuming, of course, that I hadn't just given him permission to break my neck or something equally as horrific. Who knew with these people? But all I did was place three fingers on my temple. There was no sparkle, no lights, no rhyming words, but the man performed magic. A warmth spread from his fingers. It wasn't a warmth of increased temperature. It was more a feeling of goodwill, a sense of coziness. He did that with his touch. And my headache? Gone. Okay, so this magic you all are convinced exists? I'm totally on board. As Bastion's hand dropped away, I sat up completely pain-free. I'm a believer. Call me a convert. How did you do that? Oh, man. Seriously, Bastion? You did a little healing woo-woo, and she's all, yeah, magic is real. The worried guy was looking a lot less worried now. He looked peeved. I ship her body from downtown Boise to the bench, but that's nothing. Ship my body? What? 
Bastion was still kneeling next to me and I got a good look at his dreamy blue eyes. Oh my God, I didn't just call his eyes dreamy. That wasn't okay, even in my head. I blamed his supercharged, sexy, spice-scented pheromones. Miles, you're freaking her out, Sabrina examined me. Or Bastion's freaking her out. She gave me a knowing look and her lips quirked into a half smile. Where am I? That seemed the safest question to ask. It, hadn't, it had absolutely nothing to do with healing magic or spicy man sense. A quick scan of the room revealed we were in an office. There was an exterior and interior door, an extremely tidy desk with a closed laptop and little else on it. Behind the desk was a bookshelf with a bunch of journals, the kind that had metal clasps and a lock, except they weren't pink and purple with glitter, more dark colors and old leather. Who locked their journal besides 12-year-old girls with nosy older brothers? Magic beans, Bastion said. Out of the blue, as if a reference to Jack and the Beanstalk meant something to me. You asked where we are? Sebastian was looking grumpier by the minute. We're in my coffee shop, Magic Beans. Oh, okay, that way, that made way more sense than a random story reference. Except, what witch calls their coffee shop Magic Beans? And I thought you were a cop. Not a witch, a person with a sense of humor, and I am. It took me a second to parse Sebastian's response until I figured out that he'd answered my three questions in the order I'd implicitly asked them. And he claimed that he had a sense of humor, but did he really? So the International Criminal Witch Police is run by a bunch of people who aren't witches. Sabrina lifted her hand, witch, but I'm just his peon. She glared at Sebastian. And Barista, the peon's boss, added. Worried guy, aka Miles, lifted a hand, warlock, transport expert, and also proud to be a barista in the best coffee shop you've never heard of. Then he pointed to Bastion, wizard, What's the difference, I asked, between witches and warlocks and wizards? What rock have you been hiding under, Sabrina asked. Hoping it was rhetorical, I didn't answer. No, seriously, Sabrina said. How do you not know, like, anything? That was just offensive. I know how to make candy, really good candy. Miles nodded. True fact, her toffee is amazing. Oh, and also those mint chocolate things with the candy shell? Holland mints. Those were quite tasty. Naturally, mine were all orange and green and purple, rather than the more traditional pastel colors. Yeah, Holland Mints, really good. He realized that Bastion and Sabrina were giving him the eye, and he blushed. I've never actually been inside the store. I didn't know that she was selling cursed candy. That's true, he hasn't. Well, not when I've been manning the counter, anyway. And I'm not selling cursed candy. Sabrina looked at me, cocked her head, and then grinned broadly. That couldn't be good. Her grin widened when she saw the look on my face. You do know you're a witch, right? I coughed as I failed to entirely swallow the laugh that burbled in my very non-magical chest. Uh, no. To answer your question, Bastion said with, with a warning look at Sabrina, witches and warlocks are one and the same. It's considered somewhat outdated to differentiate by gender, which is why it's the International Criminal Witch Police and not the International Criminal Witch and Warlock Police. I asked. I think it's because ICWP is shorter, Miles said. Not that anyone wants my opinion. He shrugged as if that was nothing new. And wizards, I asked Bastion, since I was apparently looking at one. What are wizards? Not witches. I swallowed my groan of annoyance. He knew I was at a massive disadvantage. Even though I had said I accepted magic, magic as a reality, I wasn't entirely convinced. But assuming they weren't all lunatics, Bastion knew that I was coming from a place of complete ignorance. When awkward silence didn't elicit further, further explanation, I gave up. For all I knew, the difference between wizards and witches was some weird cultural taboo. So I shifted to another glaringly obvious question. I still don't understand how I got here. Miles' eyes lit up. Now that's a question I can answer. He glanced at Bastion for permission, which was granted with the tip of his chin. Transport is all about the pull, not the push. This again. Sabrina rolled her eyes. Coffee, anyone? Since we were in a coffee shop, espresso, one shot with a dollop of cream. Sabrina left, pulling the door shut behind her in case I was considering a quick escape. If I were in a public place... And while I hadn't heard of Magic Beans, it was a coffee shop and therefore public. Then all I had to do was yell, help, 
fire, I've been, abduct I've been abducted. So many choices. No one will hear you, Bastion said. The room is soundproofed. At which point I realized the bustle of the coffee shop beyond the door had only been audible when Sabrina had opened it. A door which appeared to be unlocked. I could just hoof it out of here. I'm faster, Bastion punctuated his comment with the absurdly overconfident act of seating himself behind the desk. Most likely his desk, since this was his coffee shop. There he sat, smugly seated, and a good five feet further from the door than me. And yet, I believed him. Miles rubbed his hands together. Transport. Right, I said, pushing and pulling. Wrong. Miles frowned like I, dis frowned like I disappointed him. No pushing, only pulling. A transport expert, like myself, can pull another individual through space. But not time, Bastion clarified. No, not time. Miles looked appalled at the very prospect. No, that would be bad, very bad. Bastion's eyes glinted with something that might possibly be humor. I wagged a finger at him. Shame on you. Don't tease the transport expert. Then I turned all of my attention to Miles' explanation. Well, 99% of my attention. I couldn't completely ignore Bastion, much as I might like to. I know where I am, Miles said, and I can tag other people in advance. So then I can pull them to the known location, my location, as long as they've been tagged. Wait, are we talking about beam me up Scotty transportation? My lack of any memory of how I arrived at Magic Beans, blacking out, my massive headache, it all added up to, I wasn't drugged, you beamed me here? Miles' cute, scruffy face took on a perturbed cast. I mean, I like to call it shipping or transporting and not beaming because we're not living in an episode of Star Trek, but sure. He crossed his arms and eyeballed me. Are you freaking out? Was I freaking out? I think I'm freaking out about not freaking out. Bastion made a grumpy noise. English isn't my first language, but I don't usually have such difficulty understanding Idahoans. I'm from Texas. He seemed to accept that as adequate explanation, but I was fairly certain he'd missed my point. What I was trying to say is that I don't understand how I can possibly believe that I was magically beamed from my shop to here. But you do. Bastion made it sound like there was no question, as if it was a matter of course that I'd accept my magical beaming transport across Boise. It's because you're a witch, Miles explained. Ooh, coffee. Sabrina walked in bearing a tray with four drinks. I wasn't, I wasn't sure how she'd managed to open the door without dropping the whole thing. Probably magic, because why not? I'd bought into the mass delusion, so might as well embrace it. But it was also quite possible that she was a decent barista with solid tray wheeling skills. Thanks, Miles said as he accepted a small cup. He took a sip. He took a sip and sighed in blissful appreciation. Like I was saying, you're a witch. You're genetically pre-programmed to believe in magic. I call bull crap on that. I murmured my thanks for the demi uh, tassa that she, uh, I don't know how to say that, sorry guys, it, sound, it looks German, so I s say it like it's German. Um, she handed me. Uh, it smelled fantastic. My cousins were convinced that their house was haunted when we were growing up. I never believed that. Oh, and my great aunt, the one I'm named after, she used to claim she could see the future. Also didn't buy that. Because that's not magic. Bastion accepted his coffee from Sabrina without a word. No thanks, no smile, no acknowledgement. Real magic you'd recognize and accept. I glared at him, but he didn't get the hint. Sabrina winked at me. It's okay, he pays, that's enough. And she'd, she'd given him a pink mug with a delicate handle and small glittering hearts sc scattered across its surface. Score one for Sabrina. He looked between the two of us, again as if he were translating in his head. I drank my exceptional espresso with exactly the right amount of cream and tried to keep my temper in check. Nothing like a nasty mood to ruin good caffeine. Miles was blissfully and obliviously enjoying his brew. Sabrina was alternating between watching me and Bastion. She looked way too amused for my liking. And Bastion? He leaned back in his chair as if he had nothing better to do than accuse me of cursing candy, slapping some cuffs on me, and shipping my unconscious self halfway across Boise. Why am I here? Miles lost his blissful look. Oh, boss, don't tell me you forgot to officially arrest her before you had me ship her here. 
No, he arrested me for the distribution and sale of cursed candies, I believe. But it's garbage. I didn't do it. And even if I did, a cop wouldn't zap me to his wizardly lair, remove my cuffs, and ply me with coffee unless he wanted something from me. Sabrina sighed. I'm telling you, Lena, you did it. You made the candies. The candies are cursed. Ergo, I cursed the candies. Whatever. Why am I here? I pinned Bastion with a stare. He said his <laughs> pink typo. He set his pink coffee cup down. I'm offering you a deal. I was sticking to my story, innocent until proven guilty and all that. Assuming the witch justice system worked like the non-witch version. That was an uncomfortable thought. And it went downhill from there. What if I was a witch? What if those particularly foul moods I'd been in when creating my alleged cursed candies had actually cursed the candy? What if someone had become ill or worse, from eating my candy. Finally, I spoke into the silence. What kind of deal? You help me find the person who used your cursed cupcake topper to kill a man, and I won't charge you as an accessory to murder. Okay, this is chapter four from Cutthroat Cupcakes, uh, the first cursed candy mysteries book. And no adult beverages today, so it's afternoon right now. Murder? Pretty sure that was me speaking, but it was a little echoey sounding. I carefully placed the demitasa on the small coffee table next to the sofa. She doesn't look so good. <clears throat> Excuse me. The hint of worry was back in Miles' voice again. Boss, did you not mention someone used her supercharged, cursed cupcake topper to off someone? Sabrina still wasn't sounding too worried, possibly was having a good time pointing out a potential failing on the part of her boss. My cupcake topper killed someone. I really didn't feel so good. Good thing I was sitting on the sofa, except that might not be enough. I lowered my head between my knees. After a few seconds, the room stopped spinning. A few more seconds, and I felt like I could lift my head without negative repercussions. All three occupants of the room were eyeing me with some trepidation. I'm not going to throw up on your rug. I was pretty sure I wasn't going to throw up on the rug. I mean, if it came to that, I'd make an effort to hit the trash can which led to a scan of the room. The only reasonable receptacle was the waste paper basket under Bastion's desk. Please don't soil the rug. Sabrina's dry tone was accompanied by a glare. I found it since Bastion hates to shop, and I like it. It covered most of the empty space in the middle of the office, and it was a combination of various shades of aqua, teal, and blue, much like my hair. It was pretty, soothing. An interesting choice given that Sabrina was whatever the opposite of soothing was. Turbulent, contrary, rude. Bastion interrupted my musings. What do you think of the offer? I wasn't reeling or about to lose the contents of my stomach, but I also didn't appreciate being confronted with the reality of my predicament quite so quickly. Give a girl a minute, why don't you? I snapped. To breathe, to think, to decide if I could work closely with a level 11 hottie who smelled like Christmas and cuddles. What? Where did that come from? Christmas and cuddles? Cuddles didn't even have a smell. I was losing it. All this magic nonsense, my first run in with the law, being shipped off halfway across town, and it all scrambled my brain. I needed to slow this train down. I'm not sure I understand my options fully. You don't want to be charged as an accessory to murder, Miles said, with a look of utter confusion on his face. No, I don't. I didn't even know I didn't even need to know what the sentence for such a crime was. I knew I didn't want to face those charges. But I'd like to know what I'm committing to, who exactly I'm involving myself with, and what the terms of the deal are. Bastion sighed, and if I didn't know better, I'd think he was exasperated. Except I did know better, because any reasonable human being, or even wizard, wouldn't expect a person to agree to a deal without knowing what the deal entailed, and most especially not a woman who'd discovered mere moments previously that witches weren't just a Halloween fashion statement. If these people will write that... Oh, hold on. If these people were right, then I'm a witch. That's an excellent place to start. Bastion gestured to himself, Miles, and Sabrina. And we're the regional law enforcement branch of the International Criminal Witch Police. I eyed Bastion, who I'd pegged as a few years older than me, possibly in his early 40s, than his support staff. Miles and Sabrina looked like they were barely out of college. Then again, the older I got... Typo, sorry guys. 
Then again, the older I got, the younger people in their 20s seemed. The three of you are it for the entire city of Boise. Bastion huffed. City? Town. Hey now, no smack talk in Boise. I'd lived here five years. But that was long enough to recognize that the place definitely had its charms. I'm not talking smack, I'm stating a fact. It's a town, not a city. But to answer your question, the three of us cover the greater Boise area. His lips pulled into a grimace. In so much as there is a greater Boise, a greater metro area. I let that comment slide. Better to pick my, pa my battles sensibly, and fighting over the German import's bias against Boise wasn't looking like a winner. The specifics of this deal, I prompted. Bastion I Bastion's eyes were at half-mast, and he... Another typo, sorry. Bastion's eyes were at half-mast, and he leaned back in his chair. If I didn't know better, I'd say he could care less about the outcome of this negotiation. And this was a negotiation. But I did know better. Something about his demeanor, and I couldn't pinpoint what, said that he... said that he wanted my help. Badly. It was like the candy, candy motivations of Sticky Tricky Treats patrons. I simply knew that my answer mattered to him. As I said, you helped me catch the murderer, and I don't charge you as an accessory. You provided the means by which the victim was killed. Okay, you provided the means by which the victim was killed. I have ample grounds, grounds to charge you. He said that last part purely to unsettle me. I would not be unsettled. Well, I would, but I wouldn't let him know it. And the duration of this agreement... however long it takes to catch the killer. The question had surprised him, except why? A contract with no defined completion time? Uh, I didn't think so. No, you've got a week of my time after shop hours. After that, killer or no killer, you cut me loose. And I'd be doing some serious research on curses, how to break them, how to make sure I didn't create them, small things like that. He heffed out an exasperated breath. No, that was it, no counter offer. He really didn't get this negotiation thing. Why do you even want to work with me? It was our idea, Sabrina said, surprising the heck out of me. Mine and Miles. We think you're harmless, but he's a stickler for the rules. Miles jerked his head in Bastion's direction. The boss man was not happy that Miles had shared his opinion of my harmlessness. But I was, totally harmless, completely. Who hasn't played around a little with some minor cursing, Sabrina shrugged. Me, I replied, I haven't played around with minor cursing, or major cursing, or any kind of cursing. Well, that's just not true, Sabrina smiled at me. She even looked like she meant it, in an I'm maybe a little impressed with your accidental, accidental skills way. Which she proved with her next comment, you created the raw material for what became a murder weapon. Wonderful reminder. Thanks for that, I smiled back. Yay for me. No, Jail for you, Bastion said, and he claimed he had a sense of humor. My offer, I reminded him, one week, after shop hours, my undivided attention. He didn't flinch, and yet I could feel it. He wanted, maybe needed, my help. Expression blank, he said, you have two choices. You can go back to your shop and pretend like none of this had hap has happened. That sounded fabulous. And also, like I might be missing the punchline. Bastion continued, in which case, you'll likely be charged as an, as an accessory to the murder of Bartholom Bar uh, Bartholomew Bitters. Wow, I picked his name. You think I'd be able to say it? Let's see. Why did he have to tell me the name of the victim? Poor old Bartholomew Bitters. He had to be old, right, with a name like that? Except I didn't need to be worried about Mr. Bitters. I needed to be worried about me. What happens to someone convicted as an accessory to murder? I don't suppose it's a fine, is it? The witch tribunal isn't fond of fines, Bastion said. Of course they're not. They were a witch tribunal. They probably went for stoning and hanging. His lips twitched. Don't worry, they got rid of the death penalty years ago. More sniggering from Sabrina. Like three years ago. I must have looked as freaked out as I felt because Bastion glared at Sabrina. Sabrina's kidding, Lena. Okay, I'm kidding, Sabrina agreed. But trust me, you don't want to be convicted, and they're really not... And they're not really big on ignorance of magic um, as a defense. Or accidental magic as a defense, Miles added. And since the boss man doesn't want to tell you, you'd be looking at five to seven. If 
five to seven years, my voice came out as a squeak. When Miles shrugged, I cleared my throat and said, what's my other option? Bastion had mentioned two choices, and the first one was a hard pass. Five to seven years in prison was not going to happen if I could avoid it. Close your shop and help me investigate. As the creator of the raw magic that killed bitters, you're uniquely situated to help me find the killer. Close my shop? I never closed. If I was contagious, which was almost never because I was weirdly immune to colds and flus, I shut down candy making operations, upped my part-timers hours, and brought in temp help. Twice in five years I'd done that. Once for food poisoning, and the second time because I'd had a funeral I had to attend in Texas. My namesake great aunt's husband. Aunt Sophia had threatened to disinherit me if I didn't attend. Whatever. But then my cousin had threatened to send inappropriate items to my place of work if I didn't go and keep him company. Since he was a professional hockey player and lived for pranks, I didn't want to guess what he'd consider inappropriate. A package full of insects? Probably not. He'd done it before. A huge packaging tube marked in bold as containing a dildo? Nope, he'd done that one already as well. Edible poop chocolate? Already done. And also, boys were gross. Sabrina heaved a huge sigh, saving me from recounting every single one of Bryson's terrible pranks. I guess I can help out at Sticky Tricky Treats, but only if I get paid in candy. Was she serious? Uh, going once. Sabrina, who was rude, confrontational, twice. But who listened to my order and delivered the perfect espresso? And yes, I hollered, thank you. Oh, you have so been had. Miles looked at me sadly. She can eat her weight and chocolate and hard candies. Daily. He received a rude gesture delivered with great enthusiasm by my new temporary employee. You can't do that inside my shop. Small children frequented sticky tricky treats, and sweet little old ladies, and even sweeter little old men, and churchgoers, and just actual nice people who didn't make obscene gestures in the normal scope of their day. She blinked huge, faux innocent blue eyes at me. Those had to be fake lashes. No one had eyelashes that luxurious. She's pulling your leg, Bastion said. Sabrina can be perfectly appropriate when necessary. But Miles is right. She can't eat a lot of candy. I'm much more careful with our sweets inventory now. Sabrina stuck out her tongue at Bastion. You're a terrible boss. Wait, I said. We never agreed on how long this temporary arrangement would last. Until we catch the killer. When Bastion saw the frustration that had, had to be plastered across my face, he added with a smile, however long that takes. If only it was Bryson's off-season, I could con that turkey into babysitting my shop any July or August, so long as he had time to work out and access to a rink. But it was early October, Bryson wasn't available, and I really hoped that I still had a shop by the time we caught whoever had killed poor Mr. Bitters. Let's get this investigation rolling. I was on the clock. For the foreseeable future, I needed to be making candy for, for Sabrina to sell, finding a killer, or sleeping. Oh, with one small exception. I pointed at Sabrina. You and I are meeting at the shop at nine, training on the basics so you don't blow up my shop. She scowled. But you don't open until 10. Someone who knew my store hours, and yet I was fairly sure she hadn't been in my store before. I knew it, Miles shook his head. You're terrible. You totally volunteered so you wouldn't have to work morning shifts at Magic Beans. She smirked at him. I'm not working at Magic Beans at all until they close this case. 10 to 6. Oops. 10 to 6.30 every weekday and 9 to 4 on Saturdays. My schedule, schedule is officially full. Thank you very much, new head barista of Magic Beans. Oh, this does make me head barista. Miles gave Sabrina a virtual high five. Somehow I felt like the only loser in the, somehow I felt like the only loser in this deal. Everyone else seemed to have gotten exactly what they wanted. Miles, the head barista position at Mag Magic Beans. Sabrina, later mornings in all the candy she could eat. And Bastion, a personal servant to run all of his crime-fighting errands. Ugh, I moaned. Please don't tank the success it's taken me five years to build. Pfft, run a candy shop? Easy. Piece of cake. Or should I say a piece of handmade specialty chocolate? She sighed. She actually looked just a little bit happy for two seconds. Then she glared. I haven't sucked at a single job yet, and I don't plan on starting now, so stop your complaining, lady. I turned to Bastion, looking for, I don't even know what, a sign that this investigation wouldn't last for months, that my shop wasn't about to die a miserable death at the hands of a cranky 20-something. But he just arched his eyebrows. Right, because he was a grump and didn't care about the survival of my tiny specialty shop. Let's get this show on the road, mister. 
I wanted this investigation wrapped up as quickly as possible, preferably in less than three days, because that's how long I had before stock would start to look thin, and I'd be splitting my time between acting as Bastion's investigative lapdog and making candy. Bastion stood up and stretched. He was already tall, but with his arms outstretched, it felt like he filled the room. All right, then. He pulled a set of keys from his pocket and headed for the exterior door. Any chance you're going to tell me where we're going? I stood to follow him and realized I had no cell phone, no wallet, nothing but a spare hanky and a few cinnamon candies stashed in my pocket. He's like that, Sabrina said as she planted herself behind his desk, all silent and bossy. I used to think it was a German thing, but it's definitely not. It's just Bastion. We're going to meet Mr. Bitter's widow. Then he turned to Miles. You're in charge. You should probably check on Bethann. Miles leapt to his feet. Why? What's up with Bethann? She was doing fine an hour ago. What do you know? Oh, man. Is she going to quit? Bastion. But Bastion was already out the door. Seeing as he was my ride and I had no cash or cards on me. Wait up. I hollered after him. Okay, this is chapter five of Cutthroat Cupcakes. And if you guys have been having a happy hour drink with me, I am drinking watered wine tonight. Um, welcome to my strange world. I like red wine with water. <laughs> all right, chapter five. It's all about where the magic comes from. Bastion started talking as if we were in the middle of a conversation, except for the last 10 minutes we'd been riding in silence in his bright orange cross track. Bastion hadn't bothered to tell me where we were headed, but my best guess was Meridian, a suburban town to Boise. Since I hadn't a clue what he was talking about, I said, sorry? Hands precisely at 10 and 2, Bastion spoke without taking his eyes from the road and his mirrors. You asked about the difference between witches and wizards. That difference is primarily where the magic comes from. Oh, well, it was a start. I watched Bastion check his side, mirror, side and rear mirrors. Again, who checked their mirrors every few seconds? Yeah, that was probably technically good driving, but who actually did it? No questions? I was waiting for you to illuminate me. But if you want a question, do you mean where the magic comes from in a geographic sense? If your family is from Transylvania, then your magic comes from, oh, I don't know, drinking blood? Ooh, I really hoped there weren't witches out there running around drinking blood because gross. That's unsanitary. Thank goodness. When he didn't elaborate, I said, Bastion, will you please explain what you meant about the difference between witches and wizards? He switched lanes, hands still at 10 and 2, his gaze still shifting between his side and rearview mirrors. Which magic is emotional? Wizard magic is logical. I think we're being followed. Emotion versus logic. Was, it, was this a Kirk versus Spock scenario? Intuition versus science? What did that mean? Wait, someone's following us. What? Why is someone following us? I don't know. Using the console, he made a hands-free call to a number listed in his contacts as transport and tech. Bethan quit. Miles didn't bother with a greeting. How did you know? How do you always know? She was struggling with the feel of the coffee. All the signs were there. You just have to look closer. Miles groaned. Poor kid. Staffing issues were the worst. Although I didn't know what the feel of the coffee was, it did seem like something a good barista would have. Maybe it was like my candy motivation game. Typo. Bastion uh, tapped his thumb against the steering wheel a few times. I need you to identify a car. Not right now. I'm mourning the loss of yet another employee. Couldn't she have made it through Sabrina's secondment? That's not how employment at Magic Beans works. You either have the feel or you don't. You know this, Miles. With a little more experience, you'll catch the signs earlier. Bastion tapped his thumb against the steering wheel ten times. He hesitated, then did it ten more. Is that enough mourning? I swallowed a laugh because, really? No, Miles replied, but what have you got? White Honda Civic. Bastion rattled off a license plate number. Just a second. Miles whistled an unfamiliar tune with the tip-tapping of computer keys in the background. Oh, look at that. You've got the Merry Widow on your tail. That car belongs to Delilah Bitters. But we were going to visit Bitters' wife. What was she doing following us? Need anything else, boss? Because if not, I'm going to continue to mourn the loss of Beth Ann and the corresponding increase in my work hours until we can hire a replacement. I'm planning to mourn with excessive amounts of sugar, fat, and caffeine, in case that wasn't clear. We aren't hiring a replacement. Bastion spoke over Miles' sputter of indignation. 
you, Miles, you are hiring a replacement. Welcome to Head Barista. But you never let Sabrina hire anyone. That's correct. Bastion continued to appear unruffled by the fact that we were being followed, and he kept his hands at 10 and 2 and checked his mirrors. The man was a machine. Do you think Sabrina should be allowed to meet prospective employees? Oh, right. I'm on it, boss. Miles paused. After I make myself a mocha latte. With extra whipped cream, Bastion's lips quirked. You deserve whipped cream and chocolate sprinkles today, Miles. Then he ended the call. Aw, maybe Bastion wasn't the grumpiest German transplant in Boise. Is it weird that the woman on, we're on our way to see is currently following us, I asked. Not particularly. Bastion's eyes narrowed. What's interesting is the choice of car. She normally drives a bright blue Corvette. Flashy. Exactly. Maybe the Corvette's in the shop, and it's not like she went out and bought a car so she could stalk the man who's investigating her husband's death. For the first time since I'd gotten in the car with him, Bastion took his eyes off the road. He gave me a speculative look, then said, it's possible that's exactly what she did. Uh, no, I was kidding. Haha, <laughs> totally a joke. Because that would be crazy, first of all, and second, no way I'd randomly guess exactly that crazy scenario if that's what's happening. Besides, wouldn't a good stalker lease? I wouldn't expect Delilah Betters to be a good stalker. Time to do a little stalking of my own. I did an internet search of Delilah Bitters on the off chance she had some kind of social media profile. Someone who drives a bright blue Corvette wants to be noticed. And wasn't that the point of social media? Sure, some people used it to keep in touch, but a lot of people used it as a way to say, hey, world, look at me. Gotcha, Delilah. She was definitely the second type because she had profiles on all the major social media sites. When did Bartholomew, Bartholomew Bitters die? Yesterday. Weird. She'd updated her profile pics today, only a day after her husband's death. Each picture was a version of the same theme. She appeared in a long, dark veil with only her boldly colored lips visible behind the lace. What do you have? He seemed grumpy that I'd discovered some tidbit about the widow without his cranky pants help. Actually, that wasn't fair. This was probably more a resting bastion face than an actual mood. I have a woman who's so completely grief-stricken that she's updated all of her social media profiles with sexy widow profile pics. I really shouldn't judge. Shouldn't? Nope. Everyone grieved differently. No judging. Seems really tacky. I covered my mouth with my hand, but I was too late to hold back my zinger. Bastion glanced at me, then his lips twitched. Facial tick? Oh, he thought that was funny. There was no love loss between the bitters. Okay, so she's a suspect. He shrugged. A witness? A suspect? Like there was no difference? Maybe Mr. Big Bad Detective needed my help more than I'd realized. Even I knew those two weren't interchangeable. So you think she might have actually bought a car? A car? On a passing whim? Thought, I'm gonna follow that Bastion guy around in my sneaky white everyman car and see what he digs up on Big Daddy's death. Bastion choked. Or maybe it was a laugh. Wow, definitely a laugh though he managed to swallow most of it. Big Daddy? Bartholomew? He had to be over 100. And suddenly, I was feeling very disrespectful with my comments about his name, his age, and even going so far as to give him a nickname. He's not, wasn't, over 100. It's a family name, and he preferred it to the abbreviation. Bartholomew was not a Bart. He checked his mirrors again. And it's quite possible she did buy the car specifically to blend in during her husband's investigation. You probably intuited as much. Which, in which intuition can be honed to a certain level of reliability, and a lot of witches in retail are especially good at intuiting motivation. Sure, I'm good at candy motivation. Intuiting the reason a person is in my shop and what candy might brighten their day isn't the same as intuiting the motivations of some random person I've never met. And for my motivation guessing skills to work, I have to actually see the person. Fiery redhead, legs for miles, big showy sunglasses. Oops. I saw her at the Magic Beans parking lot. Worse, I'd even seen her get into a small white car with dealer plates. Why are we driving out to Meridian when we could have just nabbed her in the parking lot? A faint pink colored his cheeks. The German driving machine was blushing. I didn't see her in the parking lot. I only caught the tail when we were almost on the interstate. Not entirely implausible. He'd walked through Magic Beans' rear exit several seconds before me. He could have already been in his car when she left when she left by the public entrance. Uh, typo. Okay. 
Wait a second, if he'd spotted our tail before we'd even gotten on the freeway, Bastion, that was over 10 minutes ago. I tried to get a look at the driver, but she hung too far back. He tipped his head as if reluctant to explain in greater detail. He must have been in a giving mood, though, because he said... I didn't want to interrupt Miles since I knew Beth Ann had likely just quit. Cranky exterior, squishy where it counted. My, my German grump was a softy. Since you didn't see the wife at the coffee shop, how do you know she has legs for Miles? I've met her before. The magic community in Boise isn't very large. And... When he didn't immediately spill all of the good gossip on Delilah Bitters, I said, what do you think of her? What do you know about her? What should I know about her before we interview her? I'm interview interviewing her. You're approaching the interview with an open mind and a closed mouth. Besides, you already looked up her social media profile. I crossed my arms and looked out the window. And yes, I was going for the full-on pout. This, par this partnership bit the big one. No information, on sus no, sh no information sharing on suspects, no witch history lesson, no sharing of personal details, and apparently I was keeping my mouth shut. That wasn't offensive, not at all. Also, the car smelled like hem, Christmas and cuddles. It was so wrong because cuddles didn't smell like anything. Witch and wizard magic runs in families. That's why Miles and Sabrina were so surprised by your ignorance of our laws. You should have learned the basics from your family. I looked up from my perusal of the widow bitter's shiny but not personally revealing social media presence. His blush was, his blush was gone, and shocker, his hands had drifted to a more natural position on the steering wheel. I'm not adopted or anything, and I'm pretty sure mom didn't get busy with the milkman. He tipped his head. Was he translating again? You're certain both of your parents are your bi biological parents. Yes, that's what I'm saying. As American as Bastion sounded, the idioms were his non-native tell. That and the cute accent that every once in a while slipped in. Perhaps I should try to be more literal. But where was the fun in that? It's rare for magic to skip several generations, but it's been known to happen. How many generations of Dorchesters are still living? My great aunt Sophia is the oldest. You should call her. I snorted because that was the last thing I wanted to do. He shrugged as he signaled to exit the interstate or not. Okay, so magic is inherited. What was that earlier about the head and the heart? Emotion versus logic, but the head and the heart work as well. Wizards tap into the logical self to create magic, which is tap into the emotional self. Oh. Oh? He'd made a few turns now and hadn't consulted his GPS. We were slowly moving to the outskirts of Meridian. Yes. Oh, I've had an unpleasant epiphany. That kind of O. Oh. All of the candies you stole, confiscated, he corrected. Took without paying, I countered. All of them were created under less than favorable circumstances, I cleared my throat. I may have been hacked off when I made them. Hacked off? Angry? He turned into a driveway leading to a structure that I wouldn't exactly call a house. Um, yeah, angry. I eyed the massive edifice that someone considered a home. Distracted by its size and ostentation, I had some difficulty completing my thought. Angry is about right. So how big is this place, and does a small army live here? At a guess, 10 to 15,000 square feet, and with the passing of Bartholomew Bitters, only Delilah and her staff are in, resi in residence. In residence, whatever the heck that mean. Whatever the heck that meant. And her staff? Um, the white civic pulled up next to us. It looked like Delilah's attempts at stealthily following the investigation had been foiled, assuming that's even what she'd been doing. Delilah exited her new car, which didn't leave us much time. What's the plan, I asked, since Bastion wasn't offering any hint of what was about to go down. I've already told you the plan. I'm interviewing. You're keeping an open mind. That's not a plan, Bastion. That's... I about peed myself when the lady we were discussing tapped on my window. Bastion rolled it down as I tried to get a handle on my racing pulse. I shouldn't have been so surprised, but she didn't even register my peripheral vision. Sunglasses resting on the very tip of her nose, she eyed the two of us over the top of them. Bastion, hello. Her words were more flirtation than greeting. She almost purred them. And the leaning was pretty darn obvious. At least it was when, you're, when wearing a plunging v-neck blouse and paired with the intensity of her hungry gaze. Me? She ignored. Are you going to invite us in? Bastion asked in a flat tone. That man knew how to take all the flirt out of his words. She paused, seeming to consider his question, then looked at me. Her nose wrinkled slightly. No, I don't think so. Perhaps you'd like to explain why you're, t why you're tailing us, Bastion asked. Tailing you? 
I picked up a coffee from my favorite coffee shop and then came home. I haven't a clue what you're talking about. She leaned forward for... She leaned... Come on. She leaned forward further, displaying a good amount of cleavage. The dashing widow seemed to have a thing for Bastion. Unfortunately, I was between the two of them, so I got an eye full of her double Ds before I leaned back on my seat and let Bastion do exactly as he said, handle the interview. He stepped out of the car and moved around to the passenger side. You don't, you don't drink coffee, and you're not a regular patron of Magic Beans. He crossed his arms. Why were you tailing us? Lovely man. I stayed included in the conversation, and yet I didn't have another woman's assets shoved in my face. Just like I'd thought, he was like good bread, crusty on the outside, but all soft and yummy inside. Bastion, again with the purring, this lady. And li people, I cannot purr. I'm so not as flirtatious as this woman, so, you know, you're going to have to imagine that, Bart. Um, Bastion returned her melting look with a hard one of his own. She pushed her glasses back up on her nose, and her posture changed. She ditched the inviting softness and stood taller. She had to be six feet in those heels. How did she even drive in them? Driving in heels was the worst. When she spoke, her voice had lost its sex kitten quality. Fine. I need to know what happened, and you're not the type to share details. She removed her sunglasses. Am I a target? Now that was an interesting development. And now I understood what Bastion meant. What Bastion meant when he said Delilah was both a suspect and a possible witness. Investing crime, investigating crime wasn't exactly a skill I'd developed over the years. I'd had a number of jobs before landing on candy making, but nothing that involved, oh, crime or law enforcement, because I wasn't a criminal. Except that wasn't exactly true. Not any longer. Accidentally, accidentally helping someone murder Bartho Ugh, Bartholomew Bitters. I have not had that much wine, people, I swear. Uh, accidentally helping someone murder Bartholomew Bitters placed me squarely in the category of criminal, uh, squarely in the category of criminal, however unintentional. Ugh. Why would you be a target, Bastion asked, apparently unaware or unconcerned with my mini freak out in the car. This, she gestured at him with the hand holding her glasses. The other had moved to her hip. This is why I'm trying to follow you, you and your non-answers. Bastion remained stubbor stubbornly quiet. Good for him. Way to hold out against the possible murderer. Except we sort of needed her to uh, tell us things in case she was the witness and not the suspect. When neither of them spoke for an uncomfortably long time, preferring to glare, Delilah, and stand stoically silent, Bastion, I said, So, uh, I'm sorry for your loss, Mrs. Bitters. And I was, more than I hoped she would ever know. I didn't want to be known as the purveyor of the raw materials for murderous curses. Not in line with my branding. Also, I wasn't a psychopath and didn't have a death wish. For a brief moment, the briefest, her lower lip trembled. I only saw because she was in profile to me. She hadn't bothered to turn as I spoke to her. When she did turn to address me, there was nothing resembling grief on her face. No strong emotion at all, except perhaps triumph. Didn't you hear? I won. I'm the fourth wife, and I get the entire estate. Rather than judging her for that comment, I made note of three more suspects. And truly, I didn't judge this time, because I did think Delilah was grieving, for her, was grieving her husband, whatever type of marriage Bastion believed them to have had. But back to our suspects list, our suspect list, are now, um, oh, here we go, okay. Back, but back to our suspect list, are now three ex-wives deep suspect list. Who was more likely to hate Bartholomew Bitters than his three ex-wives? Oh, gosh. And Delilah would likely be dealing with the fallout at her husband's funeral. I'm so sorry. The word slipped out because, because I was. I wouldn't want her to be, I wouldn't want to be her for any amount of money. She smiled, but it was forced, and her eyes turned bright with the dampness of unshed tears. Thank you. She turned to Bastion. I've altered my will so that everything goes to charity in hopes that will stave off any possible issues with the family. Feel free to spread that information freely. Then she turned on her towering heels and left us. Once the front door had closed behind her and Bastion was again behind the wheel, I said, did she just tell us that she's afraid her family is going to murder her? Her family or bitters, he confirmed. Uh, we need to get a look at Bitter's will. Wow, I do not like apostrophes. Okay, uh, we need to get a look at Bitter's will and her old will. Three ex-wives and however many nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc., littered both sides of the Bitter's tree family. Looked like we had the beginnings of a lengthy suspect list. 
which only made me which only made my sympathy for Delilah Bitters grow. To suspect the people nearest and dearest to you of such a terrible deed, she had to feel very alone and unloved. I sent a text to my favorite hockey playing cousin. Thanks for not being a money grubbing psychopath. His reply: I love you too, you freak. And then I started googling the Bitters family. All right, this is chapter six for um, the Curse Candy Mystery Series. First book, Cutthroat Cupcakes. Oh, and um, Drink of the Night is uh, Wasatch Brewery's Blueberry Hefeweizen. All right. And it's been a while since I've looked at this because I'm doing revisions on Fairmont right now, the third book. So this will be probably slow. Uh, chapter six. Pretty sure this isn't what Pinterest is for. Sabrina eyed my murder tree board. Family tree just seemed wrong because real family shouldn't show up as murder suspects in an investigation of one of their own. Simple solution. I'd gone with murder tree instead. I needed a place to put all my research last night. After being dumped at the shop where my car was parked, Bastion had told me to get my shop in order for an extended absence. I'd done some of that last night and some research. Research. She blinked her ridiculously thick lashes. They had to be fake. This is research? It's a bunch of pics you stole off social media. Well, yes. The Bitters family needed to learn about social media security settings. I snapped my laptop shut. I'm not justifying my murder tree project. We only have another hour of training before Bastion picks me up. Which was why I had my laptop with me at the store today. I was going to work on my murder tree board in the car. It seemed like a better option than lengthy silences filled only by the passing scenery. Sabrina gestured to my point of sale setup. I get all this. It's not rocket science. It's a lot like what we have at Magic Beans, except there I'm expected to make amazing coffee after I take orders and payment. Here, I only have to bag the goods. Right. Speaking of the goods, we need to do a, a review of the merchandise. <clears throat> no. She twisted a lock of her long, almost black hair around her finger. Panic swelled. She said she could do this. Bastion said she could do this. You can't work here and not be familiar with the chocolates and candies. It's a boutique store. We sell expensive specialty candy. People expect decent customer service from a knowledgeable salesperson. In fact, they expected exceptional service from a passionate salesperson because Sticky Tricky Treats patrons were accustomed to dealing with me. Uh, let's see. Oh, Lord, what had I been thinking giving her the key to the shop? She could never do this. Sabrina was the antithesis of good customer service. She was going to ruin my business. The tiny bells attached to the door tinkled merrily as a harried mom rushed in. No kids, just her, but I could tell. She had the look. She caught me unawares because we weren't open for another half hour. The front door shouldn't have been unlocked. She looked at me and stopped all forward momentum. No small task because she'd been moving at a good clip. I know you, your sign said 10, but the door was open. I was hoping Sabrina sailed forward from behind the counter and greeted harried mom with a charming smile. How can I assist you today? The woman's demeanor instantly brightened. Thank goodness. I need chocolate, a lot of chocolate. I forgot that I was signed up for dessert for my book club this evening, and this is the only time today that I can get away. You're right across the street. Work's crazy, and then I have to pick up the kids after, and Sabrina stopped her with a hand on her arm. We've got this. How many people in your book club? 20. Usually half come, but this was a good one, so I think maybe chocolate for 15 people? Sabrina guided her to the chocolate counter. Tell me about your book club. While the woman rattled on about the book of the month, the vibe of the group, and even talked about some of the individuals who regularly attended, Sabrina pulled out a box and started to gather a solid selection of chocolates for the group the woman had described. Not inspired choices, but darn good for her first customer interaction. At least as on point as my part-time help, Lucy, who was no slouch. Sabrina was good. Smooth, efficient, familiar with the choices, or faking it really well, and warm. She was more than polite. She was attentive and kind. Once she rang the customer up without any issues, and the woman had left the store with a smile and a piece of chocolate to save her on the walk back to her office, I said, that was very well done. You don't say. By the way, I already know the stock. You have an online store, and I'm not an idiot. 
You checked it out ahead of time. Well, duh, yeah, I did. I had the sudden urge to hug her. And instead of squashing it like a mosquito, I went with it. Her body relaxed against mine for about 0.3 seconds. Then she said, okay, enough of that. You'll be on your way today after Bastion picks me up. Oh, sorry, you'll be on your own? Oh, you'll be on your own today after Bastion picks me up. Lucy's finishing at midterms. Whatever that entails as a grad student, so she won't be here until tomorrow. I read the email you sent me, and even if I hadn't, the schedule is posted right there. Sabrina pointed to, pointed to the schedule I'd attached to the wall next to the employees-only door leading to the kitchen. She'd read my email, studied STT's online stock, and even read the attached guidelines for handling food that I'd sent. I knew she'd read the attachment because we used the thin disposable gloves common in the food industry. Magic Beans was more a wash your hands and tongs kind of place. This is going to be great. Great was an exaggeration, but I thought maybe it would be okay. Maybe with just a little luck, my entire business wouldn't collapse while I was off hunting a killer with a grumpy German wizard. Uh-huh. The look she gave me told me she knew exactly what I was thinking. What's my employee discount? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, fair enough. We can revisit a discount after you see how amazing I am. We'll assume I'm earning the going rate for exceptional customer service representatives in a boutique candy store, so slightly higher than minimum wage. That should give me about two dozen chocolates for each full work day. I'm seriously paying you in candy? Well, yeah, that was the deal. Except the whole all I can eat thing isn't going to work for me. I just bought a really cute pair of jeans and they need to still fit when this gig ends. Hence the fancy math I just did. I couldn't pay an employee in chocolate. That was just, just weird. I'm not even sure that's legal. Bastion will sort it. She waved a hand like that wasn't a problem at all. Oh, and I'm definitely going to need access to your website credentials. My website? Where up to 30 or 40% of my revenue was generated on a good day? That panicky feeling was back again. Relax. I'm a whiz with that stuff. That stuff, I muttered. Wouldn't someone who was a whiz know what that stuff was called? Online sales. I'm going to upgrade you, she narrowed her eyes. This is non-negotiable. Your current system is some weird, easily hackable garbage you put together yourself. Also, if you don't give me the credentials, I'll just hack into it myself. She smiled. It was not a friendly smile. Yep, I'll get you that information. Good, now show me how your shipping for online orders works. So went the, rema the remaining hour of Sabrina's training, with me vacillating between terrified she was going to be the demise of my business to tentative moments of hope that it would all be fine. Near the end of her training, I emerged from my small kitchen to find Bastion perusing my stock. I quickly scanned the store for other customers, found none, and said, back off, mister, you're not stealing any more of my candy. I'm loaning you one of my best baristas. That should be more than enough payment for a handful of goods you couldn't sell anyway. He barely looked at me because he appeared to be shopping. Unlike the last time he'd been in my shop when I got no sense of the treat that would make him smile, this time I had a glimmer. Dark chocolate covered pretzels. Hmm. He strolled to the counter where all the chocolate wares were displayed. A quarter pound. He directed this comment to Sabrina, whose lips were twitching, probably with the snarky words she was holding back. Technically, Bastion was a customer, and therefore untouchable. I approached her, gave her a side hug, and whispered in her ear, he's still your boss, give him hell. She melted with a, dr a dramatic flare and wiped her brow. I thought for a second or two that I'd have to be nice. She wrinkled her nose, to Bastion? That's just wrong. Bastion didn't seem amused, but he also didn't seem surprised or annoyed. This appeared to be their normal dynamic. Sabrina very carefully chose his chocolates, packaged them nicely, and handed them to him with a smile, a genuine smile. I think you'll really enjoy these, boss. Aw, so sweet. Just don't choke on them. And she was back. If you've antagonized each other enough, I'm ready to go. I slung my backpack strap onto one shoulder. I bought pretzels I didn't antagonize. He flashed his innocent baby blues at me. Christmas and cuddles. And I was surrounded by the sugary sweet smells of my candy store, so it was just looking at him that made me think it. So wrong. So, so wrong. We ready, I asked. Parking in Boise was amazing, even downtown, so we were in Bastion's cross truck and underway in minutes. Not even five minutes passed before Bastion said, remember how I told you to keep an open mind when we interviewed Delilah Bitters? Such an improvement over yesterday's car ride where I'd done all of the conversation initiating. 
I remember the part where you told me to keep my mouth shut. He rolled his eyes. Okay, he didn't, but I swear he wanted to. Mostly, he was just checking his mirrors and focusing on driving like a responsible adult. Did I say a word when you spoke? I bit my lip. Or even comment on the fact later when I drove you back to the shop. I might have made an annoyed, grumbly, growly sound because he wasn't wrong. He hadn't complained. He hadn't said much of anything on the drive home. And I tried repeatedly to engage him in conversation. That cute thing he did where he'd blurt out some weird fact about witches or wizards when it got too quiet in the car, he definitely hadn't done that on the way back into town. Well, he prompted, that is correct, Bastion. You did tell me to keep my trap shut yesterday, but you did not berate me when I failed to do so. This time he definitely looked heavenward. He might even have muttered something unflattering in German. Do you recall the difference in how she responded to you and to me? That might have something to do with the fact that I bothered to offer my condolences to the woman. Her husband had died the day previous. Anyone with an ounce of compassion would do that. Possibly, he shrugged. The, imp the important point is that you meant what you said. You were genuine. I tried to recall what I'd said. Just that I was sorry her husband had passed. Heck, of course I was sorry. I'd played a part, however unwilling and unknowing, in his death. I need that. Sorry? I've been traveling down a path of guilt and regret and must have missed something. Stupid ex and his stupid text. Stupid neighbor and his stupid leaf war. Stupid me for making candy while under the influence of ex-boyfriend and bad neighbor-induced nasty moods. Your genuine response is, I need them. I'm not sure I understand. You want me to go around keeping an open mind and blurting out whatever pops into my head as we investigate? No. I want you to keep an open mind and be genuine. Tomato, tomato. But I wasn't going to argue with him. Why? Because I'm a wizard investigating what is most likely a witch crime. Nope, still not an explanation. But there was a kernel of information in there. So we're for sure looking for a witch. Most likely. Well, anyone with some magical ability should, um, should have seen the raw cursing magic in your, candle, in your candies. It would take another witch to use that raw material to form a targeted curse. A killing curse. That's right. He turned down a street that I recognized from yesterday. Where are we going? Magic beans. After two hours training Sabrina, I'm sure you need some caffeine. Also, I want to see this murder tree you've created. Sabrina was such a traitor. Not that I hadn't planned to share my weird creation, but I'd planned to share it on my timeline. When, if, it proved useful. She was impressed, I think. Otherwise, I doubt she'd have texted me. He tapped the steering wheel a few times. If I would have offered my condolences to Delilah, she wouldn't have believed me. You did imply to me that her marriage wasn't the best. I believe the words you used were, no love lost between them. I'm not sure I would have believed you. And there was that blush, just the faintest tint of pink high on his cheekbones. He'd done the same when he'd missed Delilah in the Magic Beans parking lot. I may have underestimated her attachment to her husband. She's very flirtatious. Ah, Here's a hint for you, big guy. Some women flirt because they can. Because it's sort of power they can wield. Or maybe because it's a part of their personality. Bastion shook his head. He had a does-not-compute look on his face. I'm pretty sure Delilah falls more into the manipulating men with her wiles camp than being some kind of light-hearted, touchy-huggy person. Either way, flirting doesn't mean someone's actually interested or wants more. Maybe my radar is off. Nope, she's definitely attracted to you. Oops. And there I'd gone and crossed the line. But really, the man had to know he was a hottie. He shrugged, looking more than a little uncomfortable. She flirts with other men. Okay, a few things. Um, it's been a little while since I've recorded a chapter because I have been working on the revisions and um, pre-release for uh, sniffing out Sweet Secrets, which is the third Fairmont book. So if you haven't checked that out, that's coming out in just a few days, uh, the 24th. And also, I will not be drinking anything but water because I just finished a happy hour with some of my buddies virtually, since we're still in lockdown here. And I was drinking, let's see, it's by Cascade Brewing, a Pear Mary, which is barrel-aged blonde ale with pear juice and rosemary. It's really good. Anyways, uh, so technically I'm drinking water, but earlier I had Pear Mary. So we're going to call tonight's drink Pear Mary. <clears throat> Chapter 7.
Sebastian. I grabbed his tense arm and tried to pull him closer. I ended up pulling myself toward him. Hector, Bastian's tone was glacial. Okay, that was weird. He'd only said one word, but I still felt the chill of it. I whispered, hoping none of the patrons could hear me. Is that guy glowing? Because that is all kinds of wrong. We're in a coffee shop. Um, all right. And I am editing as I go, as you guys know. I just found a little bit of an issue. Okay. Bastion's lips twitched in an effort to break free of their master's control. The smile never emerged, but it lurked. Also, the tension in his arm disappeared. Not that I was clinging to his arm. Okay, maybe I was, but a glowing red man was adequate cause for concern. I let go, but didn't step away. At normal volume, giving no regard to the customers surrounding us, and Magic Beans did a much brisker trade than my boutique chocolate shop. Bastion said, yes, that man is glowing, and it's considered bad manners. Basically, the equivalent of a toddler's temper tantrum, which only made the man glow all the brighter. The man named Hector. That name was awfully familiar. Then it came to me. You're the lime green Speedo guy. I didn't recognize you with all your clothes on. A nearby customer giggled. And poof, just like that, Hector's rosy red glow faded. He stormed to a rear door marked office, then stood impatiently waiting in front of it. After a few seconds, he said, well, let me in, you... He paused and looked around at the good number of patrons watching him. Whatever he'd planned to call Bastion, it wasn't for public consumption. Just open the door. Which sealed the deal. I felt no remorse. I just embarrassed a man on purpose. But then, what did you expect when your family posted updates of your tropical vacay on social media and tagged you wearing cringeworthy teeny tiny swimsuit briefs? Worse yet, in a shade flattering to only the smallest percentage of the population. Lime green was not Hector's color, to be clear. Again, the Bitters family needed to have a look at their social media security settings. Or, here was a revolutionary concept, don't post pictures you find embarrassing for the world's viewing pleasure. Alternatively, Hector could own that, could have owned that lime green speedo choice, and my attempt at embarrassing him wouldn't have worked. But that wasn't the kind of guy Hector was, and I'd intuitively known that. Bastion strolled, he made it that obvious he was in no hurry, to his office door, then paused and looked at Hector as if he were a bug. That was a skill I wouldn't mind acquiring. I'd wield it as my weapon of choice every time a solicitor ignored my, clear, my very clearly worded sign warning them away. Hector stepped aside, giving Bastion more room. I'm not sure what I expected. Hand waving? An incantation? Some kind of magic, certainly, because otherwise Hector would have just opened the door himself. But nope. Bastion put his hand on the doorknob, twisted, and pushed the door open. Then he gestured for Hector and me to enter. I walked into a familiar room. It was just as I remembered. The tidy desk, the blue rug Sabrina was fond of, the sofa that had cradled my aching head after Miles had shipped me from sticky, tricky treats to here with his magic, beam-me-up Scotty witch technology. Apparently, I hadn't been that out of it after my magical transport. Since Bastion was likely to sit behind his desk, I removed my coat and took a seat at the end of the couch closest to the desk, leaving the awkwardly placed and seemingly uncomfortable chair in front of Bastion's desk for Hector. Bastion indicated it before carefully draping his coat along the chair that sat behind the desk. I'll stand, Hector said, as if that would give him an advantage. Unlikely. He seemed the sort to be perpetually at a disadvantage. He also seemed the sort to disdain chocolate eaters and candy lovers. In other words, not my kind of people. Bastion merely inclined his head in an as-you-wish kind of way and sat. I assume there's a reason you've come to my place of business and made a spectacle. A spectacle of yourself was implied. Just because you have ice water running in your veins, wizard, that's no reason to criticize those of us with actual feelings. My brother is dead. Oh, and now I felt bad. I'd put the murder tree together, but I hadn't had a lot of time to study the connections between the family members. But then that comment, ice water, I hadn't known Bastion long, but he was a teddy bear compared to the vibes I was getting from temper tantrum throwing Hector. You haven't spoken to your brother in over a decade. Was there a recent reconciliation of which I'm unaware? And that dissolved the remaining twinges of guilt. Thank you, Bastion. Also, he told me to keep an open mind and to go with my gut. My gut didn't like this guy. It also wasn't doing, it also wasn't doing somersaults and pointing at him as the murderer, 
but an intuitive organ can only do so much, and that likely exceeded reasonable expectations of it. You know there hasn't been. Hector's face turned a reddish, purplish shade. He was awfully angry for a guy who had magic. Bastion better have penciled in some magical self-defense in our schedule. I didn't want to get squished flat by a murderer's magic if I could avoid it. Or even a magenta-faced, sometimes lime-green speedo-wearing witch with the self-control of a toddler. Again, I ask, why are you here? Bastion might not have ice in his veins. I knew he was as soft and squishy as the next super nice guy walking down the street. But he did manage to retain a calm demeanor like a grown-up like grown adult person does in the face of unsolicited conflict. Hector's response was delayed by a knock at the office door. Bastion called out, enter. A timid mouse of a woman let herself in carrying a tray with three drinks. She proceeded to deliver the drinks we hadn't ordered. I thanked her when she handed me a mug and only then realized that timid mouse wasn't quite right. She was thin but tall, medium brown hair, brown eyes. Her demeanor was subdued, which had led to my false conclusion. But if you looked, really looked, she was gorgeous. The kind of beauty that might be quiet if it wasn't highlighted with mascara and lip gloss, but it was there in her bones and her skin. Interesting. I glanced at her name tag as I took my first sip. Perfect. Thank you, Hannah. She turned bright red, didn't make eye contact, although she came close, aiming perhaps for my left earlobe, but murmured, you're welcome. And okay. I sipped my perfectly prepared light roast with a generous helping of macadamia milk as she handed Bastion a black coffee and Hector an herbal tea. I figured the man would be in a place that served heavenly coffee and his perfect drink would be an herbal tea. And I didn't doubt that it was his perfect drink, because our shy barista had nailed mine even though my last drink here had been something completely different. My morning, afternoon, and evening caffeine needs varied. It wasn't exactly a caffeine snob. It was simply a question of chemistry and sleeping habits. And also, maybe I was a little bit of a caffeine snob. Hannah hurried out the, hurried out the door once the last drink was delivered. Excessively shy, yes, but she probably had a better chance at making it at Magic Beans than her predecessor, Beth Ann, who'd lacked the much sought after feel for coffee, according to Bastion. The elusive feel seemed to cause Magic Beans ongoing staffing issues, so maybe Hannah, with her special touch, would put an end to the revolving door of baristas at what I suspected was going to become my favorite coffee shop in Boise. That evil witch did it. She murdered my brother. Hector's color wasn't looking too good. He'd faded down to a pinkish hue, but was all sorts of bright colored now, not glowing, normal, non-magical, ruddy. The man looked like he was on the cusp of a medical event. Stroke, heart attack, passing out from excessive ill humor. Also, I really hoped I'd heard him correctly, and he'd, call, he'd called someone an evil witch and not the other word that sounded very similar. Bastion might toss around a profanity or two, but in German, and not actually aimed at a particular person. I might even let the occasional naughty word pass my lips, but Hector's words carried the weight of personal conviction. My gut was telling me that Hector had a mean streak broad enough to be a little scary and a person who could practice magic. Who are you referring to? Bastion sipped his coffee. You know who. Your prime suspect. The only person you've bothered to interview so far. He paused long enough to shoot a judgmental look at me that was tinged with a hint of creepy old pervy man. When you weren't busy getting up to who knows what with your new girlfriend, that feeling you get when you've been on a transatlantic flight, when your seat neighbor coughed the entire flight and the flight attendant spilled a drink on you because some idiot tried to pass her in the aisle at the exact moment she was handing you your drink, as if your skin is covered in a layer of filth and germs and a stickiness that cannot be wiped away. That's how I felt after one lingering look from Hector. But I kept my mouth shut. Not because Bastion had explained my role as the primarily silent partner, but because my gut said it was a good idea. This man had an agenda. He was here for a reason, and I didn't think it was remotely rooted in a desire for justice. You know, English isn't my first language. Best to speak plainly. I worked on my poker face, as if Bastion had any, un any issues understanding purple-faced Hector. Please. For some reason, Bastion wanted Hector to accuse Delilah in plain English. That, that woman... That money-grubbing whore of a wife of his, Delilah, she killed my brother. Liar. The word was past my lips before I had even registered the underlying certainty with which I spoke. Hector was pleased. 
I wasn't particularly pleased with myself. I didn't normally go around telling people that they were full, that they were full of it. First, I'm not a particularly confrontational person, and second, how would he even know? But after examining him and my feelings, I was even more certain. He's lying, Bastion. He has no confidence in that statement whatsoever. Why would he lie about that? Why accuse her if you don't think she did it? Hector's jaw trembled with his fury. He didn't bother to answer me. Hector doesn't inherit under the current will. Delilah inherits everything. Bastion kept his cool, even when facing a ticking time bomb of an opponent. Neat trick. I could feel my heart rate increasing and knew from past experience, my ex-boyfriend came to mind, that I sometimes said and did regrettable things when faced with a volatile and unreasonable human being, especially when intent on, li intent on lying. But not Bastion. He was still calm, unruffled by Hector's glares or the visible signs of his wrath. It was almost as if the more Hector lost control, the greater Bastion's became. If that was a spell, I wanted it. Wizard magic or no. Turning my attention back to the puzzle of Hector's accusation, some of the pieces fell into place. If she's convicted of murdering him, she can't inherit. She should never have inherited anyway. The bulk of Bartholomew's estate is family money. It should stay in the family. I'd been spot on with that murder tree concept. This guy might not deserve a spot in Bartholomew's family tree, but he was a great addition to the murder tree. Poor Delilah. If this was, a, if this was the garbage she was dealing with, I could see why she thought she'd be targeted. Well, Hector leaned forward in his chair. What are you doing about it? You talked to her for maybe two, three minutes. You didn't even question her properly, and you should have been arresting her. The man was spitting mad, as in he spat as he spoke. I leaned as far away from him as possible. As if the spitting and general malevolence of the man weren't enough, he was drinking his tea. He wasn't drinking his tea. He'd abandoned it on Bastion's desk. Someone gives you a drink, at least pretend that you like it. Maybe that wasn't good manners. Maybe that was a personal quirk. Regardless, I was underwhelmed by Hector in all ways. So underwhelmed that I was having difficulty seeing him as a mastermind behind his brother's death. And with Delilah as the current beneficiary, his murder of his brother would certainly have required some masterminding. He'd have to have killed his brother in a way that implicated Delilah and also ensured that the funds he clearly so desperately wanted came to him. Also, unless he was a fabulous actor, he didn't have a clue who I was. Bastion's girlfriend? Not last I checked, Mr. Bitters. I wasn't his girlfriend. I was his extorted crime-solving labor. The woman paying penance for having created the raw material of the curse that killed Bartholomew. I realized Bastion was waiting for some indication from me. I shook my head slightly, hoping that conveyed my belief that he wasn't the guy. As a member of the deceased's immediate family, you'll be informed of the outcome of the investigation. Unless you'd like to share any actual evidence against Delilah Bitters, you may leave. You may leave. Bastion just dismissed the near apoplectic man like he was a naughty child called before the principal. I wanted to pat him on the back, mostly because I didn't like Hector one little bit. Guilt nagged, because whether he'd been estranged from his sibling or not, the man had still lost a close relative. As he stood in a huff, I said, I'm sorry about what happened to your brother. It was a terrible thing. All true. I didn't offer sympathy over his loss because I wasn't entirely sure he felt any remorse for losing his brother, only his brother's money. His gaze skated over me, once again making me feel dirty, and then he stormed out of the office, closing the door with the force of an enraged teenage girl. Wow, are all witches so melodramatic? I asked after the sound of the slam door had faded. Legit question, because I'd gotten strong melodrama vibes from Delilah as well. And how about the sleaze quotient? He was a seven or eight, easily. Miles and Sabrina are witches. I considered his reply as I sipped and enjoyed my coffee. True, Miles is nothing like bitters. Nothing like the bitters. The bitters family. The bitters family. Sabrina, actually, neither was Sabrina. She had a certain flair, but it was more of a sharp edge than overblown posturing. Good point. So it's just the bitters. No, there are certainly witches who choose to embrace their inner child. I choked and almost snorted coffee out of my nose. That is not what that phrase usually means. He took a sip of his coffee and amused light glinting in his eyes, which you know very well. Hey, you mentioned the will. Did you get a copy of it? He nodded. All of them, actually. Very straightforward. Everything to Delilah. What was interesting, however, was that she was the first wife set to inherit. 
Delilah's words rang in my head. I win. She said, I win. I thought she was being intentionally crass about the fact that she was the only wife to have outlived her husband. None of them were ever included in Bartholomew's previous wills beyond token amounts, and they were completely removed once divorce settlements had been made. That was odd. Do you think he left them out because of what Hector said? Because most of his wealth was inherited and he thought it should stay in the family? Bastion kicked back in his chair. No, none of the wills left significant bequests to family members. Which means we have three ex-wives with motive? Assuming revenge is any kind of motive. Bastion raised his eyebrows. I took that to mean that revenge was a solid witchy motive. Mm, just going to change that a bit. Okay. Um, we have one, perhaps two, ex-wife suspects. One of Bartholomew's wives died a few years ago. Another is living abroad, though I've got Miles checking that she's still in France. That leaves one suspect living locally with a motive for revenge. I swallowed the last of my coffee. No to-go cup, so I figured best to finish up before we walked out the door to check out our only local ex-wife. I stood up. Okay, then. Let's go meet this ex. No, let's have a look at this murder tree of yours first. I swallowed a groan, wasn't excited to share my hodgepodge of miscellaneous stolen social media pics. Miles busted into the office through the door to the parking lot. Bastion, you'll never believe. He leaned over, grabbed his knees, and panted. Bastion tapped his finger on his desk ten times, and then ten again. And? He lifted a finger. Oops, it's Miles. Miles lifted a finger in a classic, just one second gesture. He did look awfully red in the face. Is he going to be okay? Bastion blinked slowly. Miles lives around the corner. I'm assuming he ran from his apartment instead of calling for some unknown reason. But yes, he's a 26-year-old man in good health. He'll be fine. I'll be sure to start taking him on my short runs after we've resolved this case. Bastion lifted his head with a panicked look at Bastion. Nope, not going to happen. Gasp. And check your phone. I called. Gasp. The second wife is dead. Murdered. Bastion frowned, then pulled his phone from his pocket. I was in the middle of something. I replied to Miles' questioning. Oops. Miles' questioning look. Hector Bitters threw a temper tantrum. She just missed him. Directing my question to Bastion, I asked, which wife is the second one? The witch living abroad. Um, Cammy. If she was still in France. Miles? Miles shook his head. Back in the States. Seattle. He looked less red in a sweaty pink. Um, he looked... He looked less red, more a sweaty pink color. I scrunched up my nose. You really should get a little more exercise, Miles. I exercise. He looked awfully offended for a guy whose recovery time resembled that of an asthmatic man three times his age with a video game addiction. When was she killed, Bastion asked. That's why I was in a rush. Tuesday, boss. Only a day before Bartholomew, and Seattle was just a hop, skip, and a short plane ride from Boise. Bastion muttered a word in German that I was fairly certain was a profanity, which made sense because we have to get to the third ex. She has no idea what's going on. Unlike Delilah, who was at least on guard against evil acts. Yes, Bastion agreed as he stood and grabbed his coat. Um, you've tried to reach her? Wide-eyed, Miles said, yeah, no luck. Another reason I sprinted my out-of-shape butt here hoping to catch you. Call Delilah Bitters. He shrugged into his jacket. Tell her what's happened to Cammy. I'll text you Melanie Hampton's address, boss. Miles hollered, but he was talking to Bastion's back as he exited the office to the parking lot. Once again, I found myself running to catch up with Bastion for fear I'd be left behind. It didn't occur to me until I was in his car and securing my seatbelt that a normal person might actually want to miss whatever happened next. A confrontation with an embittered ex, or worse, the discovery of her dead body. Hi everyone, I got a little behind on recording some of my chapters because of my release and because I had a release today, my drink of the day, and yes, I have been day drinking, um, my drink of the day is Gemma de Luna Moscato Italian Sparkling Wine. So I allow myself on release day to have mimosas, except I had the mimosa without the orange juice today. So, all right, um, chapter eight. I was starting to see a pattern to Bastion's finger and thumb tapping. 
After 10 taps with his thumb on the steering wheel, he redialed Melody Hampton's number. He'd already tried four times with no result. Thumb and finger tapping were Bastion's crutch for patience. If I wasn't so worried about ex-wife number three, I'd probably find it endearing. Boise might be the largest city in Idaho, but unlike cities in Texas, it had no major through roads, no loop that swooped around the entirety of the city, no interstate that traveled through its heart, no highway running along the edge of town. With the exception of a short strip that locals called the connector, if you traveled in town, you drove on roads with stoplights and stop signs. Boise was an entire city of neighborhood streets. Our journey to Melanie Hampton's home, a mere five miles away, took a total of 15 minutes, and that was with almost no traffic. 15 minutes of finger tapping and redials. If that wasn't a clear sign that Bastion was concerned for Miss Hampton's well-being, then his insistent knocking on her door once we arrived sealed it. Unlike Hector Bitters, I didn't see Bastion as a man with ice water in his veins, a man with an even temper who kept his cool in stressful situations. Yes, that man I saw. Just not right now. When the pounding of his open palm on Miss Hampton's door yielded no results, Bastion started in with his fist. I touched his shoulder, and he stopped. If she was home, she'd... Typo. She'd have heard you the first ten times. He stepped back and pinched the bridge of his nose. No, there wasn't any ice water in his veins, and his heart was huge. I rubbed his arm. Just because she's not answering her door, that doesn't mean that anything has happened to her. She could be traveling. Gosh, she could be at a hair appointment, for all we know. He gave me an intent look. Is that what you think, that she's got a hair appointment? What? No. I mean, I don't know. I frowned at him. Quit doing that. I don't have any weird vibes telling me she's out for a trim. I'm just saying, there's probably a mundane explanation for her absence. Something other than murder and mayhem. Maybe. But he looked calmer as he walked to her garage. And maybe Cammie's murder is a coincidence. Not that I believe that, but I also couldn't think of a reason to target Bitter's ex-wives. Hold on a second, let me fix that. Okay. Um, Isn't there something magic you can do? Something to track her location? I trailed behind him as he peered into her garage through the glass in the door. Her car is gone. He stepped away from the door and retrieved his phone from his pocket. Miles, can you... No, she's not here. I need you to... He slow blinked. Yes, Hannah does seem to have the feel. Could you... An impatient expression crossed his face. Yes, Miles, you did a fantastic job hiring her. He paused, the index finger of his left hand tapping against his cargo pants clad thigh. All that hotness and then cargo pants? Finally, Miles slowed the flow of his words long enough for Bastion to say, can you do a little digging into Melanie Hampton's schedule? Her plans for the weekend, where is she spending money, and that sort of thing. After a pause, he said, that's fine, then ended the call. When Bastion saw the expression on my face, he shrugged. He must have chugged a few cold brews after we left. That explained it. Cold brew coffee had a higher concentration of caffeine than many other um, coffee products. What that boy should have been chugging was water. He needed a keeper. To answer your earlier question, Bastion said, magic doesn't work like that. Much of it requires proximity or even touch. Failing that, then a great deal of preparation. Like Miles tagging you in advance so he can transport you in a hurry. That's right. He wandered around the exterior of Melanie's house in a suspicious manner that was bound to have the nosiest neighbors reporting on their neighborhood app. Or worse, calling the police. Could you try to look a little less like a burglar case in the joint? Peering into her windows in broad daylight is going to get us questioned by the cops. He glanced my way and frowned, then continued to peer suspiciously into her kitchen window. Nothing looks amiss inside. No dead bodies lying lying around waiting to be discovered? I was kidding, but I still held my breath until he replied. No, and no signs of a struggle. That's good news, at least. And then it all went south. An elderly woman walking a dog stopped in front of Melanie's house. I couldn't think of her as Miss Hampton if I was familiar enough to be peeking through her curtains. I feigned partial blindness in hopes Melanie's nosy neighbor would continue walking. Sorry, guys, I gotta... Sorry, I had to take a little pause there for a cough and a um, sip o moscato. Uh, all right. See, uh, I feigned partial blindness in hopes Melanie's nosy neighbor would continue walking, but that tactic failed when she hollered, hello. Before turning to address her, I glared at Bastion. Hello, 
I replied in a much friendlier tone than the other woman had used. How are you doing today? That depends. What's your interest in Mel's place? Both her and her little terrier gave me the evil eye. I jabbed an elbow into Bastion's ribcage hard enough to elicit a grunt. I told you, I whisper yelled. Wild guess. This was not one of those times I should keep my mouth shut. I smiled at Melanie's neighbor. We're trying to get in touch with Melanie. My friend and I have some news for her, and it's important we talk to her as soon as possible. What kind of news? She asked, not relenting with the hairy eyeball one little bit. The bad kind, Bastion replied. The woman turned her attention to Bastion, though the dog kept his stare directed at me. It's to do with that rotten, cheating ex of hers, isn't it? The one who died recently? Bastion and I shared a glance. How did she even know the man was dead? Don't look that way. You'll read the obits daily when you're my age, too. If I made it to her age, maybe I would. My recent introduction to the witch and wizard world hadn't inspired confidence in magical people's longevity. I'd been arrested and exposed to the murders of two women since learning I was a witch less than 24 hours ago. Hold on a second, guys. I'm... Uh... By the way, doing this is giving me, I mean, I know I'm not great as far as, I, I know I have some strange sounds when I, when I record, when I speak, um, but beyond that, this is giving me a new appreciation for people who do voiceover for audiobooks. Those guys are amazing. Um, the time that it takes for them to create one hour of, of audio is, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, it's more than you'd probably guess. All right, <clears throat> here we go. It does, in fact, have to do with Bartholomew Bitter's death, Bastion replied. Do you happen to know if Miss Hampton is expected home soon? She gave Bastion a piercing look. After several seconds of scrutiny, he, she said, Oh, all right then. She's in the mountains with her gentleman friend for a long weekend. If the news can wait, she'll be back on Sunday. She pursed her lips, clearly considering her next words. Mel works hard, and she doesn't take much time off. If you don't have to ruin her weekend, please don't which is the point at which I considered the house whose windows we'd been peering inside. It was a, a well-maintained but modest home, and small, unless Melanie Hampton's home had magical properties like the TARDIS in Doctor Who, with an interior larger than the exterior, then I'd guess it to be no more than a thousand square feet. In comparison to the widowed Mrs. Bitters, who lived in a building large enough to house a hockey team, what kind of settlement had Bitter's exes received? His third ex-wife worked so hard, even her neighbor knew about it. And while her home was lovely, it was so far removed from the grandeur of the current Mrs. Bitter's home as to be a different world. Maybe she left her work. Maybe she'd frittered away her settlement. Maybe she'd invested it and had a nice nest egg. The possibilities were endless, but I couldn't help thinking that perhaps Mr. Bitter's had been stingy in his divorce settlement. He'd been the man with the money, capable of hiring the best attorneys and spending whatever time and money was necessary to ensure his exes walked away with exactly what he wanted. There was also the possibility of an unfavorable prenuptial agreement. I looked up to find that Bastion had handled the nosy elderly neighbor and both she and her dog were departing. Sorry, I was just thinking about motives and such. He arched an eyebrow. Motives and such? Yes, the difference between the two women's lifestyles and how that might have been a motivation for murder. You're seeing Melanie Hampton as more of a murder suspect than a potential victim. Was I? That didn't feel right. I shrugged. She can be both, Bastion said. She is both. Well, I don't find that helpful. I'd like to have fewer suspects. Actually, I'd like no suspects and one killer. A killer who's arrested and safely locked away so I can return to sticky tricky treats in my life of candy making. Except that wasn't exactly our deal. Our deal was to find the killer. Find could mean simply to discover the identity of our killer, but I wanted him or her in cuffs, behind bars, tucked away from the world of people who were just trying to get by day to day with our regular non-murdery lives. I scrubbed my hands across my face. This is stressful. Hmm. We have to warn her, vacation or not, suspect or not. With any luck, Miles will find a digital trail shortly and will be able to give us her current location. Bastion headed back to his car, so I trailed behind. And oops, and if he can't find a digital trail, then we'll use magic. 
As Bastion drove back to Magic Beans, where I'd left my laptop in my rush to catch up with my fleeing driver, I talked through my thoughts about Melanie Hampton. She's out of town. That's good. Maybe she'll be safer out of town if she's not the killer. I talked on the qualifier at the end of the, at the end of, at the very last second. Um, it was interesting, but I wasn't thinking about Melanie as a killer or even a suspect. I was thinking of her purely as a potential victim. Do you want to know my impressions, even if they're based on, well, on nothing? Bastion agreed without hesitation that yes, he did want my impressions, regardless of how they came about. When I didn't immediately spill the entire contents of my churning mind, he said, what are you thinking? That Hector is a four-letter word my mom wouldn't be pleased to hear me use, but not his brother's killer. He nodded, not in agreement so much as a signal to keep talking. So I did. And Melanie, I just don't see it, her killing her ex. How long ago did their marriage end? because she's already dating a man she takes on long weekend trips. And I bet you saw the twinkle in the nosy neighbor's eyes when she mentioned Melanie's gentleman friend. The neighbor likes him. So either he's around a good bit or Melanie talks about him a lot. Anything else? The house was weird. He raised his eyebrows at that. Okay, weird is the wrong word. It was so middle class, which means what exactly? What it means is that Melanie Hampton could be my neighbor. I could run into her at the grocery store, or at my grocery store. I could run into her, yeah, I could run into her at my grocery store. She might bank at my bank. If that's where she lives, it makes her seem so, well, normal. Ah, unlike Delilah Bitters. Yes, exactly, it's weird. Delilah is the fourth wife, Melanie the third, and yet they're so different. It makes me wonder what the other two wives were like. Rachel, his first wife, died long before I moved to the area. Miles should have some kind of file put together on her later today or tomorrow. Um, he'll have started working on it already, and that's probably how he discovered that Cammy, the second wife, had been murdered. Did you know Cammy? I asked. Yes. His reply lacked inflection. And? And she wasn't a pleasant sort of woman. She was beautiful. He paused, tapped the steering wheel ten times with his thumb, then said in a much more normal tone, she was a beautiful but unkind woman. Did you guys date? Because his responses indicated some type of familiarity with Cam Cammy beyond the superficial. No, she was with a friend of mine for a few months. She left him worse than she found him. He glanced at me, but then his eyes were right back on the road and his mirrors. I'm sure Miles will have a thorough file on her as well. Left him worse than she found him. That sounded ominous. I'd be patient and read... Come on, word. Okay. I'd be patient and read all about the mysterious and beautiful, though apparently not very nice, Cammy once Miles had finished his deep dive into her history. It occurred to me as we pulled into the Magic Beans parking lot that I was no longer motivated by a desperate desire not to rot in witch prison for the next five to seven years. Primarily because I didn't think Bastion would let that happen. Bastion righted wrongs, and me ending up in prison would be very, very wrong. But I didn't need fear pushing me forward. Someone had taken my candy and used it to murder another human being. My candy that was infused with my magic. I might not fully understand how magic worked, but I was getting the gist, and I did know that it was intensely personal. It was as if someone had reached inside me and stolen, stolen my very feelings, then turned around and used them for something for, mm, hold on a second. Okay. Um, it was as if someone had reached inside me and stolen my very feelings, then turned around and used them for a terrible purpose. I wouldn't stand for it. And that's the end of chapter eight. Okay, because I am feeling super well lubricated with my release day. Gemma de Luna Moscata Italian Sparkling Wine, I am going to record another chapter. So for those of you who are actually listening to these as they release, um, you're going to get two chapters in a row, maybe three. It depends on how well lubricated and motivated I'm feeling this morning. <clears throat> so this is chapter nine. Bastion and I reviewed my murder tree, but we did it in the customer area of the coffee shop in the two overstuffed armchairs tucked away in the quietest corner. If I wasn't sold on Bastion being a secret, maybe even not so secret, teddy bear, before, I was now. 
We'd walked into the office to find a highly caffeinated Miles typing frantically on his computer. No, well, that's not right. Uh, he wasn't actually on his computer. He's on Bastion's laptop. All right. Okay, we'd walked into the office to find a highly caffeinated Miles typing frantically on Bastion's laptop. He hadn't even looked away from his computer when we opened the office door. He just pointed at the door and said, out. That needs to be fixed too, we'll fix that later. This is the, um, fix the obvious language stuff, the inconsistencies and the big stuff my, my developmental editor will point out later. Okay, um, Bastion guided me back out to the back out of the office with a hand on my lower back and murmured, he's in the zone, he's rude when he's like this, but very, very productive. In the space of 20 minutes between Bastion's phone call to him and now, Miles had changed from a highly caffeinated chatterbox to a hyper-focused research machine. In the zone indeed. While Bastion scrolled through the pictures and memes that I'd pulled from social media and pinned to my murder tree board, I asked about the wills. And I'm wondering, how did you get access to, to the wills? Um, it's kind of out of the blue, so we'll say to bidders, um, previous wills. All right, um, ah. He looked up from the laptop, resting on the ottoman place between us. Um, Delilah mentioned a family loop, so I had Miles hack it. it. Took me a few seconds to process what that meant. Bitters posted each variation of his will on an email loop with his family members. No, that couldn't be right because that was beyond odd. It was actually words failed. And not just his close family. The Bitters family email loop includes a rather extensive collection of extended family. Was he trying to make his family angry? Because why else would he share a will that excludes his family from inheriting what Hector had claimed was originally family money? I believe it was more about manipulation. He snapped my laptop shut. Uh, thanks, that was helpful. Like a snapshot of the family. It firmed up some impressions I had. I smiled. I was glad my little foray into the social side of investigation had been helpful. So how did this posting his oops, type it. So how did posting his will help him to manipulate his family if he cut them out? He'd include small bequests and then remove them. I can only assume based on his most recent interactions with those family members. I wrinkled my nose. That gets every single person mentioned and removed a motive. Bastion shook his head. Not a very good one. His practice of adding and removing individuals was practically commonplace, so why now? And no one except Delilah benefited from the latest will, so there's no financial gain. Why not wait? Let Delilah fall out of favor, see who was added back into the will over time. I guess? You don't agree? Mm. Okay. I'm just not sure. Nothing really stood out when I created the, the murder board. Even, even if one of the beneficiaries of an old version of the will were angry enough to kill, how does that tie into Cammie's death? We're missing something about the family. With any luck, Miles' files will reveal information that will help us to understand a connection. Let's see. Connection or stop sounds weird. Uh, with any like Miles background research, will reveal information that will help us to understand a connection between the motives for the two murders. This family, Miles shook his head. Miles, hello. See, this is the kind of stuff that happens. I get my peoples mixed up. Uh, okay, Bastion shook his head. The whole experience of reading through the documents was unpleasant. My family situation is, he smiled up at Hannah who had thoughtfully brought us refills. Half-calf, she murmured as she handed me a mug. My earlier drink had been full ca uh, fully caffeinated, but she'd scored another 10 of 10 for me because I was ready to start winding my caffeine consumption down a little. Bastion drank his dark roast black, morning, noon, and night, so far as I could tell. Once Hannah had left us in peace again, I said, you were saying about your family? 
oh, only that we're not close. My family situation can be complicated, but nothing like the bitters family dynamic. His phone pinged with a text. He retrieved, he retrieved it from one of his many pockets. After a quick glance, he nodded, uh, you'll be glad to hear that Cammie's murder wasn't done with an edible killing curse. I felt my eyes bug out. I hadn't even considered that the killer had used my candy to kill someone else. That murder happened in Seattle, not here. And, well, there really was no reason a murderous nutter wouldn't have used the same means twice. Half candy will travel. The stuff was highly portable and would be no problem on a plane. Are you all right? Let's see, Bastion asked. I nodded, not ready to speak quite yet. I was fine. My candy hadn't been a part of ex-wife number two's murder. Wait, I made those candy toppers a while ago. I don't remember anyone buying them, so Lucy would have made the sale, and Lucy's been prepping for midterms lately and working less. They were likely bought a few weeks ago, Bastion was stating a fact. We'd already discussed the nature of this particular treat in a potential timeline. The cupcake toppers were basically mini sugar sculptures and good for at least six months, though I would only sell them for two in my shop. The history of the cursed toppers was etched in my brain, mostly due to the unusual history behind my rotten mood and when my rotten mood when I made them. I'd gotten a video from my friendly neighbor Betty with the unfriendly neighbor with my with my unfriendly neighbor blowing leaves in my yard, except it was a little early for raking. I'd asked her, asked her how that was possible because leaves weren't falling yet. She'd captured the video last year. She'd just been hesitant to give it to me at the time for fear I'd go knocking on his door. I'd go knock on this door. He wasn't a very nice man. But then fall came around again, and she wanted to give me a fair warning of a potential repeat. It was all so silly, just a bunch of leaves. But the meanness of it had, but the meanness of it all had upset me. Lena? I looked down to find my hand clasped in, clasped in and bastions, and I realized I'd fallen into reliving the events and was in danger of reliving my feelings at the time, which boiled down to, how could people be so unkind? My disappointment had exceeded the parameters of the leaf-blowing incident. I'd been disappointed in petty, vindictive people in general, and it was that feeling, my temporary disenchantment with humankind, that, I resu that had resulted in my cursed candies. I'm sorry. I was just remembering the whole silly chain of events leading up to the cupcake toppers. What's that? What I was thinking before I fell into that rabbit hole was that if the killer had the means for the murder well in advance, why not use the same method on Cami? Another possibly related question, why obtain the means for creating the edible curse and then not use it for weeks? Let's see. Get this attribution here real quick. Buying and not using. Hmm. Every third or fourth trip to the grocery, I buy one item of fresh produce that's unique and new to me. Whatever it is, a bunch of mint or an exotic vegetable, it sits in the fridge until something nudges me to use it. Bastion sat back in his chair. The killer wanted bitters dead, but didn't commit to the deed. Maybe the time gap between purchasing the cupcake toppers and killing bitters is a planning period. I tip my head. Or maybe like the Kakuza winter squash sitting on my counter, our killer had the cupcake toppers and planned to use them at some unknown point in the future until, until Cammy, you think murdering Cammy triggered the killer to use the already purchased cupcake toppers to murder bitters. Maybe? If that's the case, then finding the reason behind Cammy's murder could be the key. Unless there's solid evidence in Cammy's murder pointing to a specific suspect, Perhaps Seattle's team of international criminal witch police led the organization in cutting-edge technology and case resolution rates. Hmm. Seattle's team is solid, but they're slow. We're waiting for them to agree the cases are linked before they'll share information. We have given them a little information we've collected, but it could be a few days before they even officially link the cases. Wow, that's unfortunate. 
Hmm. And yet more proof that Bastion wasn't as straight-laced as he first appeared. Seattle wouldn't have recruited me to help, would they? No. His reply came without hesitation. Thank you. His gaze lifted to mine. For extorting your help? For letting me at least try to make this right. Let's see, we're missing something here. He took a deep breath. I wouldn't have charged you. Not for the first offense, not when you've never even heard of the code of conduct. I grinned at him. I know. Now? I didn't know that then. He looked heavenward. You do need to have a conversation with your family's mentor. Perhaps your great aunt Sophia holds that role. You should call her and find out. This should never have happened. Sophia has known me my whole life. If she's the Dorchester's mentor, then wouldn't she have seen my magic and known to get cracking with all the education? You could have been a late bloomer. It's not unheard of. Hmm. If magic is on the Dorchester side of the family, I only have one cousin on that side. I should probably give him a heads up just in case. And I had a feeling, whether it was intuition or complete guesswork, that the Clutterbucks, my mom's side of the family, weren't hiding any secret magical abilities. I sent Bryson a quick text while I was thinking about it. How do you feel about witches? It was probably in practice or working out and wouldn't, wouldn't get to it till later anyways. Except he wasn't. His reply was immediate. Trick question, right? No, I replied. Before I could explain, a certain gorgeous widow, one whose life might be in danger, made an entrance through the coffee shop front door. She swept in, paused, let the lesser humans gathered around her admire her beauty, then strutted to Bastion in my corner. Bastion's in my... Mm, I'm not sure on the grammar on that. Someone smarter than me will fix that. Okay, um, I might be exaggerating, but only slightly. My phone pinged with a text. I knew what waited, questions from my favorite cousin that I didn't have time to answer now that Delilah had arrived. So I stashed my phone. I demand protection. Delilah placed a well-manicured hand on her cock tip. You're the law around here. Make it happen. In my peripheral vision, I caught a regular shaking her head at Delilah's dramatics, which then had me looking around. No one seemed surprised. I'd meant to ask when Hector had gone nuclear in front of Bastion's customers earlier today, but then I'd been, side um, I'd been sidetracked and had forgotten. Leaning closer to Bastion, I popped the pressing question. Are only witches and wizards welcome here? In a normal tone of voice, Bastion replied, No, we welcome everyone. Delilah rolled her eyes, then gestured dismissively at the little people surrounding us. Or so she implied. I rather like the magic beans regulars. They don't even know what we're talking about. The young woman who'd shaken her head earlier snorted, Everyone knows there's a murder investigation, Delilah. We're not idiots. Wild guess that particular regular was a witch. Or wizard. Or if there were other magical people running around, then one of them. Delilah turned so that her back was directly to the interloper, interloper. I made a note to introduce myself the next time we were both in Magic Beans and I wasn't involved in a murder investigation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, protection, Bastion? Certainly, Bastion replied. He didn't even look ruffled. He retrieved his phone from a pocket and started to scroll. I'm sure Miles' brother can fit you into his schedule. She paled. Literally, as I watched, her face lost color. No, no thank you. Interesting. I added another item to my middle to-do list. Definitely ask Miles about his brother. I'm not sure what you expect then. I can't stop my investigation to be your personal protection detail. And just like that, her attitude returned. What investigation? An accusatory stare followed her question. Bastion and I might, have, might not have been discussing the case the very moment she walked in, but we were making progress. And all evidence pointed to Bastion spending basically all of his time away, away from me, digging into the case, researching, reading Miles' research. I wasn't sure the man slept. Reading through all of Bitter's old wills alone would have taken him all night. Stop right there. I pointed a finger at her. But once I realized I had a rogue digit, I clasped my hands. Pointing was rude. I know you've lost your husband and are grieving, and I'm sure you're scared with the killer still on the loose, but you can't expect such a small branch of the... I stopped myself before I uttered the words International Criminal Witch Police. 
we were basically in public. Such a small group of investigators to have the resources to solve a serious crime and act as your personal bodyguard. And she arched a delicate eyebrow at, ba at Bastion, clearly expecting him to have some response. He said nothing. There was, however, an amused glint in his eyes, which just encouraged me. And didn't you just inherit an obscene amount of money? Can't you hire someone? That comment didn't please her one bit. She wasn't wrong. It was crass to mention the money, but these were unique times. We were in the middle of a murder investigation. Ah, uh, that, dear Lena, is the problem. Milo Fortescue, Miles, Miles' brother, is the only game in town, and he has a certain reputation. I'm just going to add an attribution there real quick so we know who's talking. All right, and turning to Delilah, he said, I believe you've had dealings with Milo in the past. She narrowed her eyes. You know I have. And a whisper that, could clear, um, that she could clearly hear, he said, Milo and Delilah used to date. But then he turned serious. Hire him. Put the past aside. She glared at him. Which is more important to you, your pride or your safety? The gorgeous redhead chewed on her lip. The action was at odds with her image of complete confidence and control. She oozed confidence, but for the nibbling. After several seconds, she lifted her chin. Fine, I'll pay the bill, but you're hiring him. I didn't really understand what difference that made until Bastion pulled out his phone and made the call. She really, really didn't want to speak to this Milo character. If he was anything like Miles, I couldn't understand it. He was nothing like Miles. Milo collected his new charge a mere 10 minutes after the call was placed. Either his business was close to Magic Beans or he'd broken a number of speed limits. When he walked in the door, I wondered for a brief moment if Magic Beans catered to giants. And this from, and this from a woman whose cousin played pro hockey. Bryson was a big guy and all his college buddies and now colleagues were big guys. But they weren't Milo big. Or maybe it was the difference in attitude. Hockey players didn't look like they'd rip your arm off and snack on it if you made a wrong move. Once they'd left, I said, she'll be okay with him, right? Bastion laughed. He's a puppy dog, unless you're a bad guy. So he's not a puppy dog, and I should be glad he's on our side. Bastion shrugged. And what's with the Milo and the Miles names? There's no way they're twins. No, Milo is older and you'd have to ask his parents, but I can say that no one ever confuses the two of them. He picked up my empty coffee mug along with his own, and then tipped his head at the office door. Now that we have one less worry, let's trick down Melanie. It's the end of the chapter. All right, sad news, no adult beverage for this uh, recording because I am, uh, I just had a tooth extracted, so I'm not allowed to do that right now. Um, and that's also why these recordings have been coming a little slower. I had uh, some difficulty speaking for a little bit, but I'm back, and we're doing Chapter 10. So uh, Chapter 10 from Cutthroat Cupcakes, Cursed Cupcake Mysteries, number one. Why was my brother here? Miles asked from behind Bastion's desk. He didn't look up from the laptop screen or seem overly concerned, just curious. Picking up Delilah, Bastion replied, he's on guard duty until we catch the killer. He took the chair typically reserved for guests, the one on the opposite side of the wide expanse of his desk. He his typically tidy space was covered in haphazard piles of paper. The mess made my skin itch, but Bastion, who I knew was scrupulously tidy, ignored the paper war zone. That's good, Miles replied in a distracted tone. Miles? Bastion waited for his head barista, head researcher, and transport expert to lift his head from the laptop he was staring at intently. That didn't happen. Miles, look at me. Finally, Miles looked up. You want her address. That's what I need. I found the agency Melanie used to book the place, cross-referenced her recent gas purchase to narrow the potential properties, then looked at booking availability. Then I, the address? Bastion's patience was admirable. I wanted to shake Miles until his teeth rattled. I have something better, Miles grinned, unless you'd prefer to drive two hours over making a phone call. We've tried her number. She's not answering. Bastion crossed his arms. Worse, her phone was switched off or set to do not disturb because it rolled immediately to voicemail. I've got the boyfriend's name, his phone number, and the number for the cabin where I'm about 80% certain they're staying. He scrawled on a piece of note paper as he spoke. Bastion smiled and held out his hand. Well done. 
Miles smacked the scrap of paper onto Bastion's waiting palm. I'll take a candy reward. Thank you very much. Holland Mints, I asked, remembering one of his favorites. If those numbers pan out, then yes, please. He rubbed his eyes and covered a yawn. Unless you have something pressing, if, unless you have some other pressing need, I've got to go get a few hours of sleep. How are you doing on Cammie and Rachel's files? Bastion asked. I'm still working on them. Should be done tomorrow, but only if I can get some decent sleep. Miles frowned. You know Rachel died in an accident that looked suspiciously not like an accident? Can I revoke my witch card? I asked. It doesn't appear to be the safest occupation. It's not an occupation. It's who you are. Bastion pinned Miles with a probing look. Explain. Accidental death was the official ruling, but the file was thin. Really thin. Miles rubbed his eyes again and sighed. Someone was coming down off his caffeine and sugar rush of earlier. It was a while ago, and you know who was running the show on Boise back then. Bastion's reply was somewhere between a hum of agreement and a grunt. Boise's witch police must not have been stellar back... When was this? I asked. Late 90s, Bastion replied. There wasn't much interest in pursuing anything but the most obvious and egregious of crimes. Are you saying, Miles, that you think Rachel Bitters, Bartholomew Bitters' first ex-wife, might have been murdered over 20 years ago? My mind was spinning with the possibilities. That certainly limited our suspect pool, if it was true and the murders were all connected. Maybe? I don't know. I need to beef up the case file if I can. It's been so long. He yawned again, his jaw cracking with the effort. I'm just not sure I buy that her death was an accident. Get out of here. Get some sleep. Bastion indicated the door with the tip of his head. We'll follow up with you after you've had some rest. Actually, why don't you let us know when you've got something? Will do, boss. And thanks for the desk and the laptop. Uh, but it'll be good to get back to my own tech. He frowned. Not, uh, no touching the paperwork. I have a system. Bastion didn't look happy. It seemed his comfort with the mess had been temporary. Just until I get the background files finished, Miles grinned. You know you love my chaos, or at least my results. Yeah. Miles must have taken Bastion's reply as an agreement to leave his chaotic system intact because he was out the door in a flash. Bastion looked down at the note still clutched in his hand. Hmm. What does that mean? I know Melanie's boyfriend. He's a wizard. He paused. That's not typical. What? He penned me with his gorgeous blue eyes. Witches and wizards don't usually mingle socially. Okay. Actually, no, it really wasn't. Why? He took a breath, opened his mouth, then paused. I need to call Callum. He lifted the note. Uh, I, he really did know this Callum man. He didn't even have to punch in the phone number on, the, on his cell. Callum was programmed in his contacts. They had a discussion in which Bastion explained the potential danger and asked for Callum's help in keeping Melanie safe. It was a brief conversation, over in two or three minutes. Very calm, very efficient. And though I couldn't hear Callum's into the conversation, it had been clear the other man hadn't responded in, over, in an overtly emotional way. Keeping a level head in a crisis, is that a wizard characteristic or just one you and your friend share? I asked. Callum's not my friend. He's programmed in your phone. He's an acquaintance. Bastion turned in his chair to fully face me. I'd chosen my favorite seat, the couch. And to answer your question, wizards do have a reputation for being level-headed. Remember, that's where our magic comes from. If a wizard lets emotions rule, then his magic suffers. So strange. And at some point, that strangeness would have to be addressed. I'd have to fill in my educational gaps. Education reminded me that I needed to figure out who played the role of mentor in my family. And once I was thinking of my family, Bryson, I snatched my phone from my pocket. I had several mis missed texts from my cousin, each escalating in concern over my simple inquiry about witches. The second to last read, call me. And the last told me he had to grab a nap before his game this evening, but that we needed to talk. Everything all right? Bastion asked. Yeah, I just, I think maybe Bryson knows more about our family's connection to magic than I do. I looked up at Bastion. I was confused, maybe hurt. No, definitely hurt. I don't have any siblings, and Bryson is my closest cousin. Not in age, but we've always been friends. This is your cousin who plays professional hockey? Yeah, he's, for, um, he's playing for the American Hockey League right now, but he's hoping to get called up to the NHL. I shook my head because that had nothing to do with anything. So he was 10 years younger than me. And he had a busy life filled with skating and weightlifting and who knew what all professional hockey players did. But we were still close, even these days. We texted. We saw each other. Occasionally. When family events happened. 
gosh, I guess it's been a while since I've seen him in person. I thought back. Maybe Great Aunt Sophia's husband's funeral? And that had been a little while ago. Bastian leaned forward, resting his forearms on his thighs. The code of conduct makes it clear that we're not to discuss magical matters with non-magical people, even family members. So if Bryson inherited magic but didn't know you that you had, he wouldn't have been able to speak with you about it. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose I understand that. I didn't, not really. We were family, and he was my favorite cousin, almost like a brother. Heck, I didn't have a brother, so in my world, he basically played that role. Bastion's phone rang. That will be Melanie. She was in the shower earlier. Callum said he'd, uh, he'd have her call once, she, once he explained everything. I nodded as he answered his phone and exchanged greetings with Melanie. I'm putting you in speaker. Bastion placed his phone on the corner of his desk atop a stack of paper and tapped it once. Lena Deutsch... Lena Dorchester is with me. She's a local witch, aiding in the investigation. Hi, Lena. Uh, I'm glad Bastion has help. I know the Boise office is small. Melanie didn't sound at all like I'd expected her to, or rather like I would have if I thought someone had me on their murder to-do list. She was calm. I'm sorry your weekend getaway has been interrupted by unpleasantness. She chuckled. Unpleasantness? Is that what we're calling murder these days? But then the line went quiet. When she spoke again, her voice was more subdued. Involving myself with Bar Bartholomew Bitters was one of the biggest mistakes of my life, topped only by marrying him. I can't say I'm shocked that choice is still haunting me, but I'm disappointed. Callum says the two of you can stay indoors for the remainder of your visit. Bastion indicated the chair he'd abandoned as he waited for Melanie to reply. I shook my head and leaned against the edge of his desk. N not a problem, she chuckled again. Callum and I can definitely entertain ourselves inside. And I've called the rental company. We've extended our stay. I have plenty of vacation. And in a pinch, I've got my laptop with me. If you think I'll be safer here, then I'll stay put. Looked like, his, um, looked like this ex-wife had definitely moved on, given she'd all but said out loud that she and Colin would be rolling around naked in bed for the foreseeable future. Yes, we haven't de um, definitively tied the murder in Seattle to, to our case, but we suspect they're connected. If they are, then we know the killer is willing to travel. But if you don't leave the house, stay with Callum, see if you've got an extra set of eyes, and remain vigilant, you should be fine. And eat in. Bitters was killed with an edible curse. No problem. We brought groceries, but I'll have Gal uh, Callum double-check all of our supplies. She cleared her throat. I understand that you wanted to talk to me about Bartholomew? Yes. We're trying to draw connections, discover who might be motivated to kill him, and also Cammy. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, we're trying to draw connections, discover who might be motivated to kill him and also Cammie. Um, all right, let's do this. What do you want to know? Her tone was grim but determined. Who initiated the divorce? Bastion didn't dance around. I did when I found out he was cheating on me. With Delilah, I asked for purposes of clarity. Actually, no, but good guess. He did cheat on Rachel with Cammie, but I believe that was the last of his wives to uh, overlap. He certainly slept around on all of his wives, except maybe Delilah. That I'm not sure about. But Rachel, Cammy, me, he wasn't faithful to any of us. He didn't even try to hide his affairs, not from us, just from the court. He alleged that he'd been faithful during the divorce proceedings, Bastion asked. He had to. Um, he had to allege his infidelity while bringing ours into question. Otherwise, he was required to pay a divorce settlement. Not a sizable one, but Bartholomew uh, ever was one to scrimp where he could. What? I snapped. You're kidding me. He slept with other women, claimed fidelity, and then broke the prenuptial agree agreements he made with each of his exes by falsely accusing them of affairs. Yes, he did. He was a gem like that, Melanie snorted. Did I just move up the suspect list? Because really, I am almost angry enough to murder the jerk for, I was almost angry enough to murder the jerk for a year, a good year or so. It wasn't the money or even the cheating in the end. It was all the lying, the false accusations. I might have been ready for the marriage to end, but I certainly never had an affair. Even if it's something I thought I could have lived with, I didn't have interest in men by that point. Not, not at the end of the, the marriage and not after. Not until Callum. We'll be sure to make a note of your, moto your motive, Bastion said. I wanted to thump him, but Melanie laughed. You wizards in your dry sense of humor. Good thing I'm dating one or I might think you were serious. The teasing tone vanished as she added, Find who did this, Bastion. He was a jerk, but I think... Well, I think maybe he loved Delilah, or as close as he could get to it. He was miserably unha he was a miserably unhappy man when I knew him, um, and that had an effect on how he treated the people around him. He was miserable, he could be mean, but he was capable of change, and he certainly didn't deserve to be murdered. 
I wanted to promise her we'd find justice for Bitters and for Cammie. Bastion spoke first, however, with a much more realistic promise. We'll do what we can to find the killer. Is there anything else that might, um, that might help us? Anything from your time with him? Any enemies that stand out? Other than his terrible family? No. And honestly, I doubt his family would be capable of any kind of murder plot. They'd be more likely to stab him with a steak knife at one of their dinner parties. They're more prone to in-the-heat-of-the-moment crimes. I coughed. I see you've met the family, Lena. Her right tone was unmistakable as she added, Lovely, aren't they? I've only met Hector in person, but yes, that was my impression. Planning and patience didn't seem to be his strengths. She made a grumbling noise. They give witches a bad name, embracing a lack of discipline and calling it passion. The bitters are not my kind of people, and I'm ashamed I ever allied myself with the family. She sighed. Callum is fussing at me. If, um, if you don't have any more questions... No, Bastion said, but keep your phone turned on and charged, both you and Callum, so we can get in touch quickly if there's a change. Of course, already done. Thank you for tracking us down, for keeping us informed, and good luck. We both stared at the phone now. I knew what I was thinking, that I believed Melanie, that I was happy she'd found her person, that everyone deserved a second chance in love, even bitters, but especially Melanie. Melanie and that I really didn't understand what Bastion had been going on about with his witches and wizards don't mingle comment. But I was fairly certain Bastion's thoughts were headed in a different direction. Witches and wizards don't usually date, he said. Or maybe not. Okay, hold on. Gotta edit that bit. Witches and wizards don't usually date, he said. Or maybe he was a mind reader. Why not? They're incompatible on a fundamental level. Hmm. Oops, I hadn't meant to give voice to my exasperation. Then again, and for a penny. That's garbage. He quirked an eyebrow. How do you know? You've been, uh, you've known you're a witch for, he glanced at his watch, around 24 hours now, and you know exactly one wizard. Aw, wasn't he just adorable? I grinned. I know you. Oh, sorry. I know me. I know me, and I know you. And I know I'd date a man like you in a heartbeat. I turned on my heel and headed for the bathroom because I had to powder my nose right now, this very second. That's why I hoofed it out of Bastion's office at lightning speed. Two cups of coffee and a full bladder were why. No other reason. None at all. That's the end of chapter 10. This is chapter 11 from Cutthroat Cupcakes. The problem with making bold statements and then running away like a teenage boy who's passed gas at the dinner table during a first date just like that flatulent teen, you have to go back. But not right away. I washed my hands, dried them thoroughly, checked my teeth, considered other stalling tactics, and finally landed on ordering a drink. I'd never actually made it to the counter at Magic Beans to order. Drinks always appeared, having been intuited by a staff member with a feel for coffee, or were ordered from an attentive passing staff as they, pa they bust tables. As I approached the counter, I realized I didn't have my purse, but Hannah was behind the counter, and she was one of the witchy crowd. Actually, I was fairly certain... Uh, hold on a second, let me fix that. Okay, uh, but Hannah was working, and she was one of the witchy crowd. Actually, I was fairly certain that while customers might be a mix of magical and non-magical, all the staff were of the witch variety. Hannah smiled. She seemed more comfortable in her skin than earlier. Maybe she was getting into the rhythm of working at Magic Beans. Although she still didn't make eye contact, I'd... I bet she could describe my left earlobe in precise detail. You're settling in, I asked. She rolled her lips together, then nodded. If I was reading her body language correctly, and I was no slouch in that department, she'd just bitten back a comment. Is everything okay? She tilted her head. Why do you ask? She looked around the almost empty store, as if searching for a flaw, as if I'd spotted some failure on her part. But the seating area had been busted and wiped down, the trash wasn't yet ready to go out, and the few lingering customers appeared relaxed and happy. I couldn't even imagine why, she, why she'd think I was being critical. I flashed a friendly smile, trying to reassure her. No reason. You make fantastic coffee drinks. Magic Beans is lucky to have you. She smiled again, not quite meeting my gaze. She really was terribly shy. Maybe an Italian soda? I hadn't actually been craving a drink, just looking for a way to delay returning to the office, but that sounded perfect. I was about to tell her light on the syrup, but stopped myself and nodded. Giving instructions to someone who created the perfect drink every time was insulting, and I didn't want Hannah to think I didn't value her, her skills or trust her judgment. When she handed me the drink, Italian soda, light raspberry syrup, she said, everything's going well with the investigation? 
Bastian and I hadn't made time to discuss the ins and outs of investigative protocols. For example, how secretive was our investigation? And did all magic... Mm, did all Magic Bean staff know how the case was progressing or just Miles and Sabrina? Apparently, I dithered too long because Hannah said, sorry, it's just that Miles had been so busy since he hired me and I know you're all working on the murder case. Cases, there are two, which we actually were only guessing at this point, so I added maybe. But you know Miles, he's a research whiz. He'll untangle any connections between the two cases, if there are any. She nodded, but I'd lost her attention to the customer who'd snuck in behind me and was waiting patiently to order. Time to face the music. Except there was no music. Bastion looked up from the armchair where he'd planted himself with his laptop, his attempt to escape the, uh, the chaos of his desk, or just trying to keep Miles' pals' paperwork intact. I've been reviewing the players, using your murder board, and the Bitters Family email loop membership list. If he didn't want to talk about my embarrassing comment, that was fine by me. Do you think we've... Uh, do you think we're missing an important area of his life? We focused on his ex-wives and his family, but was he involved in any business ventures? Is this how he treats the people in his per If this is how he treats the people in his personal life, actually, I've done business with him. His personal life may be a mess and full of questionable ethical decisions. I snorted. All right, it was full of worse than questionable ethical decisions. Bastion corrected himself, but his reputation in the business world is squeaky clean. That's odd. Is it? Many people have contextual value, values. I squinted at him, not sure I was understanding. How do you mean? Many people believe that killing a person if you're protecting yourself is morally acceptable, but that death for financial gain is not, for example. I blinked. I still didn't follow. He sighed. Consider what Melanie said about Bitter's state of mind. He may have felt justified in his actions against his former wives, which would have made the breaking of those contracts by any means possible an ethical choice in his mind. Don't tell me you think what he did was acceptable. He looked surprised. Of course not. I'm merely giving one possible explanation for the apparent inconsistency between how he handled business contracts versus legal agreements with the women in his life. Hmm. Or he was a misogynist. When Bastian arched an eyebrow but refused to address my comment, I said, fine, I have no proof of that. I do know he treated the women in his personal life appallingly. Yes, there's ample evidence of that. But back to your point, I think this murder is personal. I don't think someone has reached out to harm him after a business deal gone wrong. Why? I swallowed a smile. Was Bastion relying on intuition, or was he merely synthesizing all the information he'd thus far collected? As I said before, he has a long history of ethical professional interactions, and yet there's an abundance of evidence that he manipulated his family with promises of future wealth, was unfaithful to the women in his life, and generally treated his wives with an appalling lack of respect. Fair enough. Any chance he'd, he'd have involved Cammy in his business dealings? From what I know of him personally and what I've learned over the last few days, doubtful. He didn't mix his business and personal lives. Bastion snapped his laptop shut, stood and stretched. I didn't ogle him. Not the pleasant bulge of his biceps under his t-shirt sleeves, nor the small strip of skin revealed just above the waistband of those terrible cargo pants. When he was done, I quickly averted my eyes. Not that I'd been ogling. I need a coffee. He frowned and looked at the door, at which point I realized how unusual that sentiment was. The staff at Magic Beans had a pre uh, preternatural, there is a way to say that, that and that is not right. See, audiobook readers, they're so good. Um, skill for anticipating orders. Part and parcel with that feel for coffee, Miles and Bastion so eagerly sought in their employees, I supposed. As I pondered the oddness of having to actually go to the counter and order, and not as a delaying tactic, a knock sounded on the door. Enter. Bastion called. A redhead with a broad, easy smile poked her head in. Hey, boss. Bet you didn't think you'd see me again. Hi, Bethann. He gave her a quizzical look, which I was sure I shared. She'd quit, last I heard. Miles begged me to come back until I, I, either another staff person could be hired or Sabrina's succumbent to sticky, tricky treats ended. I told him yes, but only if he didn't complain when I waited for customers to order and didn't try to second guess every request. For someone who couldn't run away from this job fast enough just a day ago, she seemed surprisingly chipper to be here again. Can I get either of you anything? We're glad to have you fill in, Bastian replied, and then proceeded to actually order his own coffee, a black, uh, a black dark roast pour over. When she turned to me, I pointed to my half full Italian soda. I'm good. I grabbed a drink from Hannah a few minutes ago. Oh, yeah. Sorry, boss. That's why I'm taking your order. When I got here about five minutes ago, Hannah headed out early. She said she had a kind of a family emergency. Uh, she said she had kind of a family emergency. Well, that sounds funny. I'll fix that. Uh, I told her it was no problem. Hope that's okay. Uh, I'll stay. 
I'll stay to close if you can't get a regular staffer back in. He shook his head. No need, if you're comfortable here by yourself. She grinned. Absolutely. It's all the magic hoo-ha that stressed me out. If I can just fill orders and take money, I'm tickled to be here, even if it's temporary. Once the door clicked shut behind her smiling face, I turned to Bastion with a critical look. He lifted his hands defensively. We didn't fire her. She quit. Because you people have unreasonable expectations with all your talk of having a feel for coffee. I thought of Lucy, my more than adequate shop help. If I'd waited to find an employee with a feel for candy, I wouldn't have found her, and she's a gem in so many ways. Bastion wandered over to his desk and scanned the top layer of paperwork. I bet your pour over is great. He started to flip through a pile near the corner of his desk, changed his mind, and then turned to a file cabinet in the corner of the office. He pulled out a key ring with about with around a half a dozen keys from one of his many pockets and then unlocked the cabinet. He stopped suddenly and turned to me. I'm sorry, what were you saying? Just that I bet Beth Ann makes a mean dark roast pour over. I won't take that bet. She does make a mean cup, cup of coffee. She just doesn't have the feel. And when you work side by side with Miles and Sabrina, it's hard not to feel inadequate. Also, it makes our customers feel special when you remember their order at after you've had the same drink a time or two. Oh, good point. You do always get the same drink, don't you? But Bastion wasn't listening. His attention was once again on his task as he flipped through file folders. I walked close enough to see he'd pulled a personnel file. What in the world are you doing? He didn't look up from the file he was reading. Call Miles. He pulled his phone um, out of a pocket and started to enter a, number, enter a number from the file folder. He glanced at me just long enough to see I'd gotten my phone out and then, and then rattled off Miles' number. I tapped call and waited. The phone rang and rang. Miles didn't pick up, and eventually an electronic voice informed me that Miles had failed to set up his mailbox. You've got to be kidding me. No, that's fine. Apologies for the disturbance. Bastion ended the call and turned to me. I couldn't read the expression on his face. Miles didn't pick up. I didn't leave a voicemail because no, no, I know. Text him that I want to talk to him as soon as possible. I'm sure he's passed out and didn't hear his phone. That made sense, given how tired he'd been when he left. Research for this case had him keeping odd hours, so it wasn't any great surprise. I noticed that Bastion had pulled a page from the file and was referencing it as he tapped on his phone. I left Miles a quick message telling him to call Bastion as soon as he woke up. Yes, thank you for your time. He ended the call and dialed again. Hello, this is Bastion Heisman, owner of Magic Beans Coffee Shop. I'm calling, I'm calling regarding a reference for Hannah Sellers. He caught my glance, and I shivered at the look there, but then he blinked, and his focus was again on the phone call. Yes, that's correct. I'm calling to verify employment. Hannah? Why was he calling about, around about Hannah? And wouldn't that have been done when she was hired? He retrieved a pen and notepad from one of the drawers and scribbled as the person on the phone continued to speak. Thank you, and I appreciate you sharing that information. When he ended the call, I said, what in the world are you? He held up a hand as he entered the number he'd scratched out earlier. Hello, this is Bastian Heisman. And he repeated the same information as before, explaining who he was and why he was calling. When he ended the third call, there was no doubt that his expression was grim. What's going on with Hannah, I asked. Have you ever made eye contact with her? What? But I knew what. I just didn't understand why he was asking the question. I thought back to the few interactions I'd had with her, and then I scrunched up my nose. She always looks at my left earlobe. I thought that was odd, but she's also shy, so it's not that odd. I don't think she's shy. Bastion, what's going on? You're a new witch, so it's possible you wouldn't be able to spot someone who'd used your magic recently, but I think you might. And I'd spot it when I made eye contact with this person? He was only half listening to me because he was dialing once again. After waiting several rings with no response, he ended the call and then immediately began to type a message in his phone. When he was done, he looked up, yes, it's in the eyes. That would have been nice to know. I collapsed into the sofa and squeezed my eyes shut as I considered how many suspects I'd met and made eye contact with. Preferably, before I met a dozen murder suspects. He frowned at me. Not a dozen. I frowned back. Close enough. He started to flip through the papers on Miles' desk. Through Miles, well, his desk. Through Miles' papers. Okay. Good thing he didn't argue the point because anything beyond one person when it came to meeting people who might have murdered another human, another human being was too many, especially when I was a possible liability to him or her. He wasn't going to win that particular argument. It's not always visible. There are tricks to hide it. He looked up from his deep dive into the chaos on his desk. You weren't in any danger. I told him with one look just how much I thought of that particular assertion. 
All right, he looked annoyed. You weren't in any more danger than you would have been had you continued to run your shop oblivious of your newly unleashed magic. How do you know that? Because you've been with Miles, Sabrina, or me ever since I recruited you, or at home, or in your shop where I have protections in place. I blinked. What did you do to my shop? And my house? I did my best to keep you safe while you were putting off having any conversations with your family's mentor and came to terms with being a witch. He was still flipping through Miles' paperwork, but he looked up at me in between scanning pages. Oh. It had uh, only been a day. And a day and a half if I was persnickety. Whoops, wait. It had only been a day, a day and a half if I was persnickety, since I'd learned about witches and warlocks and wizards. And even if I was genetically pre-programmed to believe in magic, like Miles had explained yesterday, it was a lot. You were giving me time. Yes. I was about to express my thanks because I did need time, and I appreciated Bastion trying to give that space, give me that space to process. But then a thought popped into my head. Not a thought, a worry, a worrisome thought. Does Miles usually sleep through phone calls? Depends on whether he silenced his phone or not, and that's a function of how tired he is and how much he thinks he needs to sleep in order to work efficiently. When I ordered my drink from Hannah earlier, I mentioned Miles and the Seattle murder. I said that he was a research whiz and he'd untangle any connections between them. And now you seem to think Hannah, he stopped shuffling papers and headed straight for the exterior door. But then he paused. You should wait here in the office. His office, which not everyone could open, which obviously had mysterious protections that I could neither see nor feel. He was trying to keep me safe, which meant he anticipated trouble for miles. No, I pushed him, I pushed him out the door, and you don't have time to argue with me. He didn't, because I had set a, I'd sent a potential killer after the person digging up all her secrets. It's the end of the chapter. And here's chapter 12. Once Bastion and I were in the car and headed to Miles' apartment, I asked, how certain are you that Hannah's the murderer? Beth Ann said Hannah had a family emergency. Hannah doesn't have any family, at least not locally. She listed her roommate as her emergency contact and her employment paperwork. Bastion was worried. There was no mirror checking, none, and he was speeding. What did her references say? I assume that's who you were calling, her previous employers from her resume. Yes, and she didn't lie on her resume. His hands gripped the steering wheel tightly. But? But references don't lie. If there's something off about their former colleague, you can tell. Even if it's only the waiver and the human resources manager and the human resource manager's voice when they confirm dates of employment. And there was a waiver. There was a waiver. And I also caught a concerned employee who gave me the number of another employer she suspected Hannah might not have listed on her resume. What did that employer say? Nothing definitive, but the woman who answered the phone expressed concern for Hannah. She asked if she was doing better now. I blinked because, well, that could mean anything. Why lie about a family emergency? Why won't she make eye contact with you? Add in Miles not answering his phone and her troubling references, and yes, I'm worried. He tapped his thumb on the steering wheel. The tempo was much faster than usual, and, and he didn't make it to 10. And one of the piles on my desk had to do with a child, Rachel's child. Wait, what? Bitters had a child with his first wife? That couldn't be right. There was no mention of her on social media. She's not on the family loop emails. No. And you would have mentioned if she'd been included in a will. Bastion nodded his head. I wasn't aware Bitters had a child. And Bastion actually knew Bartholomew Bitters before he'd passed. Maybe not well, but he'd also said the magical community was small. You should have known, right? Yes. The magical tend to mix with the magical, and everyone knows everyone else's business. I would expect to know if he had a daughter. Maybe Hannah isn't Bitter's child? I spun through a few different scenarios. Say she cheated on him. That might explain his attitude toward women. Bastion frowned at me, which made me evaluate what I'd said. Right. That is a massive leap and completely unfair to the deceased woman. I looked skyward and murmured an apology. But we don't even know if Hannah is this child that Miles discovered. We don't. I sighed, but it fits. Bastion pulled into a small apartment complex. There couldn't have been more than 20 units. What isn't at all what I would have expected? If I'd had to guess, I would have put Miles in a downtown apartment in some colorful and fun part of Boise. This was nice, just unexpected. It was close to Magic Beans, though. It probably took him... Probably took him about the same amount of time to walk to work as it did to drive. 
As Sebastian put the cross truck in park, he said, you should stay in the car. Uh-huh, that's not happening. Then common sense asserted itself, but you can go first. He was the one with all the skill and training after all. Oh, and also the actual law enforcement officer. With a final grim look in my direction, he hopped out of the car and jogged through the parking lot and up a set of stairs. Unlike Miles, I did actually exercise, so I sprinted after him and caught up before he made it to Miles' door. A purple door, which was when I noticed that each of the doors was painted a different color, some bright, some bold, none boring. Maybe this place suited Miles more than I'd initially thought. Bastion wrapped his hand around my wrist and pulled me to a stop about two feet from the door. I felt a warmth pulse through me originating from his hand. I yanked my arm, I yanked my arm away and whisper yelled, Did you just magic me? Bastion closed his eyes and shook his head, except it wasn't a denial, more an exasperated gesture. With a look that clearly said, remember that promise you made? He stepped in front of me. I couldn't even see the door from behind his broad back, but I could tell he reached out and did something to it. The lock clicked and the door swung quietly open. Someone had been oiling their hinges. Bastion extended his hand in the classic weight gesture and then stepped across the threshold. Two heartbeats later, I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding as Bastion's rigid posture relaxed. She's not here, he said over his shoulder before walking further into the apartment. Miles? I scanned the apartment and found it shockingly tidy for a man whose organizational system for research involved haphazard stacks of paper. His kitchen was immaculate, his living room almost barren. I followed Bastion down a hallway with three doors. Behind the first was a bedroom, currently functioning as an office. And finally, I saw some evidence of Miles' trademark organized mess. For a 20-something, he sure did like his paper. He even had a fancy printer set up in the corner on its very own table. Before I could do more than note the existence of the papers tacked to the wall along several whiteboards. Alongside several whiteboards, Bastion had moved on. The bathroom appeared to be pristine. Perhaps it was an unused gas bath. Gas, guest bath? Or, I'm going to blame this on my oral surgery, guys. I'm struggling. <laughs> Perhaps it was an unused guest bath, uh, or Miles was a better housekeeper than I'd ever guessed. The final door revealed a bedroom. And Miles. Why is he still sleeping? Horror struck as I searched for a telltale lifting of his chest, and his face seemed quite pale. Or was it the lighting? He is sleeping, isn't he? Only when Bastion squeezed my, finger my fingers reassuringly did I realize I'd grabbed his hand. He's asleep, it's just not a natural sleep. The relief I felt when he confirmed that Miles hadn't been killed faded when the full meaning of his words registered. He's been magicked? What did she do to him? Can you fix it? Oh my gosh, this is all my fault. Promise you won't slap me. What? I lifted, I lifted panicked, guilt-ridden eyes to Bastion's. What was he talking about? You need to calm down. And then I laughed. It was a little, um, it was a little bit because Bastion knew enough about women to know. Hmm. Hold on a second. Here's a typo. Okay. And then I laughed. It was a little bit because Bastion knew enough about women to know that telling one to calm down wasn't the smartest thing to say. And it was a little because I was beginning to recognize his dry sort of humor. If Bastion could crack a joke, however small, then Miles was going to be fine. There might also have been a touch of hysteria in my laughter, but I'd deny it later. I wasn't his, an hysterical sort of woman. He's going to be okay. Yes, but I can't wake him up if I'm worried about you. I blinked at him, confused, and then it occurred to me exactly what he was saying. Bastion needed to tap into his logical self to work magic. He needed to be cool as a cucumber to do whatever needed doing to wake up Miles. No offense, but which magic has your wizarding variety beat? Hands down. If y'all can't work magic in the midst of a crisis, what good is it having magic at all? He gave me a funny look as he knelt by Miles. It's not usually a problem. With one knee on the ground, he touched three fingers to Miles' temple. He'd done exactly the same to me when he'd healed my headache. This time, though, it wasn't a simple touch and done. Bastion closed his eyes and muttered something. I couldn't hear what, over and over again. I finally realized that he was mouthing the words, making no sound at all. Maybe it was a prayer, maybe an incantation. I didn't know how to use my own magic, let alone how wizard magic was invoked, so I was only guessing. As soon as everything calmed down, when we had the murderer firmly identified and under, and under wraps, and I'd repossessed the shop keys currently in Sabrina's possession, then I'd make the dreaded call, the one to great Aunt Sophia, and the even more difficult one to Bryson. I knew I'd have to forgive him, that there wasn't really anything to forgive, but I was still mad as heck at him right now. Bastion's silent words... Oops, hold on. Bastion's silent words came to a halt and his eyes opened. But Miles didn't. That couldn't be good. But maybe he just needed a nudge? 
Miles, I called out a little louder than was strictly necessary if he'd been sleeping in the sleep of a normal person who hadn't been enchanted by a pissed-off murdering witch. He didn't stir and bashed inside. Then he turned to me, except he didn't say anything. What's wrong? I need your help. His voice was even, calm, but I could tell that he was worried. What aren't you saying? And why would he... And and why would he need my help? I was the untrained newbie who hadn't done any magic outside of some accidental cursing. And then it hit me. About 20 seconds after a normal person, one who wasn't stuck in the land of denial, oh no, she did not. That evil conniving witch had used my cursed cupcake topper to knock Miles into an unnatural sleep. Yeah, she did. But she only had the one. It had been a simple matter of inventory. Only one had been sold. <clears throat> okay, sorry, a little typo there. Um, but she only had the one. It had been a simple matter of inventory. Only one cupcake, to cupcake topper had been sold. Bastion had confiscated the rest. Then she didn't use all of the original cursed bitters. So please tell me this isn't what she did to bitters. Please. Miles was sweet. He was helpful, hardworking, a little awkward, but eager and good-hearted. He couldn't be. Hey, Lena, listen to me. At which point I realized that I hadn't been listening to him. I'd been falling into a deep, dark pit of blame. Sorry, I whispered. I was saying that he'll be fine. Even if we can't reverse it, he'll wake up. Eventually. Eventually, I practically shrieked. I couldn't resist checking to see if my hollering had woken our sleeping friend, but no such luck. Yes, eventually. I don't know when, but I do know this wasn't intended to be lethal. Whoever did this, he looked really mad. Really, unwizardly, unbastion like mad. Probably Hannah, but until we have proof, whoever did this, they didn't mean to kill him, just to keep him out of the way for a little while. Oh, the implication hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh no, Bastion, that means that she has someone else on our hit list. Or at least some kind of unfinished business. But yes, I, I suspect she has another victim in her sights. Miles must have information regarding the identity of her next victim, hence needing him out of the way temporarily. Bastion looked at me. Can you help me wake him up? I nodded until I felt like a bobblehead because yes, so many times yes, I'll do whatever you tell me. End of the chapter. Chapter 13. Mental note. Before, pro before promising someone I'd do whatever they told me, consider not making that promise. That was the promise of a frantic, desperate woman who wasn't thinking clearly. You can do this. Bastion handed me a small paring knife he'd retrieved from Miles' kitchen. It was comforting for some reason that he hadn't had that particular item stashed in one of his many pockets. Cuffs, yes. Knives, no. Right. I could do this. I just didn't want to. It's a tiny cut. Bastion was trying to reassure me, but so long as there was a knife in my hand, an expectation I use it on human flesh, I wasn't going to be reassured. Are you sure I can't just use my blood? I glared at him. Or yours? My conscience wasn't loving Bastion's brilliant idea to slice and dice a sleeping man. Warning bells were ringing, telling me this was wrong, and wasn't I supposed to listen closely to my intuition? It's not about the blood, it's about the cutting. 
Right, I knew that. He'd already explained it to me. Bastion's grand plan was for me to focus and cut. Something about the cutting of Miles' skin would cut the spell away from him. I'd just been hyper-focused on the blood because blood. Small cut. I can do this. I moved the knife closer to Miles and stopped. He was completely unaware of what was happening around him, utterly defenseless. Explain to me again why this is the only option. Because you don't yet understand your own magic. Because you also don't have the focus necessary to work magic. Because cutting the spell away from him without a parallel physical act is beyond your capabilities. And you can't do it. His finger tapped a rapid fire tattoo against his thigh. I've already tried. Except I hadn't seen him slicing Miles in his attempt to cut the spell away from his friend. Ugh, if I didn't hurry up and do this, then the killer would get that much more of a head start. I picked up Miles' arm, lifted the knife, and thought about what I was going to do. I got a good picture in my head because I didn't want to make this any worse than it already was. Quick, neat, shallow. A single swipe, and I'd cut away the magic holding him in an unnatural slumber. One swipe with the tip of the blade. Quick, neat, shallow. Cutting, cutting away the foreign magic clinging to him. I inhaled and held my breath, thinking, quick, neat, shallow. Miles' arm jerked away from my hand. What the ever-loving Miles! I screeched his name. All the last several minutes' tension released in one shotted word. I lifted my hand to my rapidly beating heart, except there was still a knife in it. I stashed it on his nightstand. Why are you both in my room? Propped up on his elbows, he glared at the knife and then me. And why did it look like you were about to open up one of my veins? I was cutting away the sleep spell that Hannah... Was it Hannah? Anyway, I was cutting away the, the sleep spell that someone put on you. Poor guy. He was probably disoriented from all that magic napping. I'm sorry, you what? He sat up and turned so that his feet were planted firmly on the floor. Then he glared at me, at Bastion, at his arm. That was when I noticed that he didn't seem groggy at all, and he was still looking at me like I was a mass murderer. Or maybe like I was a vampire ready to suck all the blood from his body. Either way... Not fondly, and certainly not as if I had broken an evil spell holding him in an unnatural slumber. Apparently, slicing up sleeping spelled people wasn't standard operating procedure. My almost victim was mad, I was confused, and only one person here knew what was going on, so I did what any mature woman in a similar situation would do. Pointing a finger at Bastion, I said, he made me do it. Out of bed, Bastion motioned with his hand as if that would hurry Miles onto his feet. We need you awake and sharp. We have questions only you can answer. Miles' rear remained planted on his mattress and he crossed his arms. Not until you tell me why I was about to be attacked in my bed by a witch wielding my favorite paring knife. She hasn't had any training and it seemed like a good analogy. She was getting a clue that Bastion had perpetrated a rather large deceit upon her. Her, meaning me. You lied. Some of my appalled sensibilities must have shown through because Miles patted my arm reassuringly. He does that but always for the greater good. But he told me to assault the defenseless man, I blinked, with a knife. Can we please move past this? Bastion ran a hand through his hair. Since that seemed a few steps beyond finger tapping, I made myself listen before he lost all of his patience. First, Lena, I apologize. It was a necessary deception since I couldn't cut through the combination of your cursing magic and the sleep spell. Oh, she, uh, she supercharged a sleeping spell with Lena's curse magic? Clever. Miles raised his eyebrows. Also, thank you, both of you. That could have had me sleeping through what's left of my 20s. I snapped my mouth shut. Gaping wasn't helpful, and he was probably exaggerating for effect anyway. And second, Bastion raised his voice slightly. You need to tell us who spelled you, Miles. Oh, I thought you already knew. Hannah. He rubbed the back of his neck, then looked up at Bastion with guilt plastered all over his face. I didn't know, boss. I hired her, and I didn't know. None of us knew. We all met her. Talked to her. Bastion raised his eyebrows, drank her coffee. Yeah, she really does make great coffee. She has the feel. Miles shook his head. If I wasn't mistaken, mourning the loss of yet another barista. Come on, let's get some caffeine in you. Bastion cla clasped Miles' shoulder. We think Hannah might have another victim and that you stumbled across information that points to that person. I don't stumble across information, Miles replied as he stood up. He swayed until Bastion placed a steadying hand on his arm. I compile information from various sources, draw meaningful conclusions, and summarize them concisely for my boss, who doesn't like to read long reports. Poor Miles. 
attacked by his employee, almost assaulted in his sleep by a newbie witch, and now Bastion was giving him grief over his process. He really wasn't having a great day. I'm sure Bra Bastion appreciates your reports, I said as I followed him into his kitchen. When Bastion didn't reply, I poked him in the ribs. He grunted, then said, most days, but we need to shortcut the process this time. I get it, boss. When he tried to prep his own coffee, I shoved him to our seat, toward a seat at the kitchen table. Why don't you discuss possibilities while I make coffee? They shared a look, which had me pointing at them. My mother would be very displeased by the development of this particular habit. You two, shush. I can make coffee. I puttered in Miles' kitchen, grinding beans, rooting in his cupboards for a French press, and then deliberating over mug choices as I waited for the water to boil. Mostly, I avoided the conversation at the kitchen table. I had other things on my mind. For starters, I'd broken a spell, a magical spell cast by a magic-wielding witch. Sure, I'd almost committed an assault on a person I was beginning to consider a friend in order to do it, but I'd done it. It was my first, almost intentional magic. Also, I'd seen the effects firsthand of what my magic, the magic I'd accidentally released into the wild in its raw and reusable form, could do. Miles had probably been kidding when he'd said he could have slept away his 20s if we hadn't woken him. But what if he'd slept, a, what if he'd slept for a week? What if no one had noticed his absence? Or they'd noticed too late? Humans needed food and water to survive, and I assumed that magical humans had those same needs. How long before a person died from dehydration? And how horrifying would that be as a method of death? Would there be dreams of wandering the Sahara, parched and desperate for a drink? Or did magical sleep exempt one from dreams? You going to plunge the coffee, Miles asked. Instead of answering, I delivered it to the table along with three mugs. A sturdy dark blue, blue mug for Bastion, one with, one with a snarky saying for Miles, and mine was bright and cheerful because I needed a little lift, more than I'd be getting from the caffeine inside the cup. I fetched cream from the fridge, splashed a dollop in my cup, because today was a day for splurges, and then passed it to Miles. What have you come up with? Hannah is almost definitely Rachel and Bartholomew's daughter, Miles said, as Bastion plunged the coffee and poured for everyone. I was putting together a case for a mystery child, so I've got a birth date, a guardian from Rachel's will, as well as some information about the girl's education. All of the information I gathered is consistent with what we know about Hannah. Except her name, I murmured mostly because I was having difficulty reconciling the shy woman I'd met at Magic Beans with a coldly calculating killer. Ooh. Hey, Memphis. That's easy enough to change, and that's assuming she's done it legally. There are even more ways to do it illegally. Bastion returned my curious gaze with an innocent one. Or so Miles says. I turned to Miles. How did she zap you? He blushed bright red, the combination of dark stubble and pink making him look like an overgrown kid. In my defense, the mystery child was only one of several avenues I was pursuing. Bartholomew was a thoroughly unpleasant person who, dis who was disliked by a large number of people, which makes for loads of research. She knocked on his door. Bastion was watching Miles as he spoke, and he let her in. Even though she was scheduled at Magic Beans, even though she had no reason to be there. Oops, to be here. Come on. And if she just showed up on his doorstep, that raised another question. How did she know where you lived? She shouldn't have, Bastion replied. Now beat red, Miles said, fine. I might have had a little crush on Hannah, which may have slowed the functioning of my gray matter. He shot Bastion a defiant look. You've had our coffee. Do you blame me? I blinked at that. Hannah was gorgeous if you looked beyond her mouse disguise, but Miles had fallen for her because of her coffee-making skills. That was new. She brought me a drink, a decaf vanilla latte. He bit his lip. It was really good. And laced with a sleeping potion. Miles crossed his arms. I didn't know that at the time. Poor Miles. That was incredibly gullible, but his sweetly innocent behavior might have saved him. What if you'd questioned her? Asked her how she knew where you lived? Asked her why she'd come to your apartment? Well, it wasn't completely checked out. She said she was stopping off on the way home and had brought me a thank you for giving her a chance. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Obviously, it didn't occur to me that she had a few hours left on her shift. Or that a normal employee wouldn't know where you lived. Because that really was stalker-level creepy for a normal, non-murdering employee. For a murderer, though, it seemed like common sense to have an eye on all the investigative players. Rub it in some more. It wasn't bad enough waking up to find you waving around a knife. I frowned at him. 
It was a tiny knife, and I wasn't waving it. Also, you're welcome for waking you up. Oh, yeah, thanks for that. I shot him a relieved smile. I'm just thankful that there was no actual assault or blood involved. So what, do you two, what did you two come up with? Is there, something, is there someone else Hannah might be after? Miles was looking steadier, which meant that we'd need to get a move on soon. Her motives appear revenge-based, Bastion said. A father who didn't acknowledge her, a woman who could be seen as breaking up her parents' marriage. Or worse, precipitating her mother's death. Miles wrapped both hands around his mug. I think Hannah's mom might have killed herself. That poor little girl. I really hope that's not the case. I paused, considering the ramifications if Miles' suspicions were true. But if you're right, Miles, then who would she blame besides Cammie and Bitters? Who did a child blame for a parent's suicide? When neither Miles nor Bastion had an answer, I ventured to guess she'd blame her mother to some degree, don't you think? I know that's not helpful, but I do think. Bastion held up, held a hand, um, held up. Hey, Memphis, no. Bastion held up a hand, silencing me. Miles, where is Rachel buried? Oh, no. No, no, no. She wouldn't do that. Miles hopped to his feet and jogged to his office. Do what? I asked. Because really, whatever it was, however appalling, of course she would do it. The woman had murdered two people. There probably wasn't much she wasn't capable of. Miles returned with his laptop. I've got everything on here. Just give me a second. If everything is on your laptop, then what's with all the piles of papers, I asked, diverted momentarily from Hannah's potential evil purpose by the fascinating workings of Miles' mind. The physical representation of the data helps me to draw connections. He tapped away on his computer and after several seconds gave us the name of the cemetery. What time is it? It's not even six yet, Bastion said as he tapped away on his phone. Oops. Well, let me fix that. He searched through the data on his laptop and after several seconds gave us the name of the cemetery. What time is it? Not even six yet, Bastion said as he tapped on his phone. We have a little over an hour. Sunset isn't until after seven. And we care about sunset why, I asked. I had my suspicions, naturally, with all the talk of cemeteries and sunset, but my suspicions were crazy. There's a possibility Hannah wants to speak with her mother, Bastion said as he tapped away on his phone. Her dead mother, Miles said, as if that part hadn't been abundantly clear. I looked between both men at their concerned expressions. That sounds like a bad idea. Very, Miles agreed, typing away on his computer. He stopped and waved over Bastion. Come here and log into this site for me. I can't get through the firewall. What in the world are you two doing, I asked. Miles with his firewall and Bastion typing away on his, tapping away on his phone, they were definitely up to something. I'm looking for a decent ritual for calling forth the dead, Miles explained as Bastion logged him into some secret website. It's forbidden, so it's not like I can just do an internet search. Calling forth the dead? That sounded bad. Very bad. At least this community of magic people I'd newly joined were smart enough to recognize that things like calling forth the dead were a bad idea. Always a silver lining. And why do you need that? Shouldn't you be looking for a how to stop someone calling forth the dead? I'm scoping out the necessary supplies. Supplies to call forth a dead person. Probably best not to ask what those were, because if he started talking eye of newt and tongue of bat or some such nonsense, I'd... Well, I had not an inkling what I'd do, but that was just disgusting. I turned to Bastion, who had finally put his phone down. I was checking on Delilah and working on backup. Sabrina's in, and she's bringing Beth Ann. Beth Ann? Miles looked up from his internet search. That's an odd choice. Bastion shook his head. Not everything is about coffee, Miles. Beth Ann has a knack for working with crystals and herbs. You should send her your list. She might have some ideas for countering Hannah's ritual. It occurred to me that we were making an awful lot of assumptions. What if Hannah isn't trying to reach out to her mom? What if she has another victim in mind? And we were dithering here doing research on forbidden rituals while Hannah might be hurting another person, probably using my magic. Miles handed a note to Bastion with a short list on it. That's for Beth Ann. He scribbled down a few items on the pad in his hand and then lifted it. This is how we'll know for sure. A few ingredients for the ritual that can't be sourced from a local garden, so will have to be purchased. Perfect. Bastion folded the note and put it in one of his many pockets. We just need to check, uh, check stock at the four possible suppliers. If any of them have a recent rush on these items, then chances are good Hannah's target is her mom. I peered over Miles' shoulder at the list. She wouldn't purchase this stuff on the internet. Wait. Uh, 
why wouldn't she purchase this stuff on the internet? That seems like the smart move since it would be harder to trace. Well, Shika said, shipping takes time. The places that sell these ingredients don't specialize in overnight delivery like the big box stores. Other than your cake cupcake toppers, Bastion said, everything she's done has been within a very short time frame. I don't think she would have planned to call forth her mother well in advance. Also, there are quality issues with online stores. Local suppliers are more reliable. That made sense and might explain how a city of Boise's size could support four specialty magic supply stores. We split up the retailers, whose numbers and websites were easily searchable on the internet, unlike Magic Beans, and called the stores. We reconvened a few minutes later and discovered that of the five items on Miles' list, four had been purchased in large quantity at three different stores over the last three days. The store clerk I spoke with mentioned the same customer also bought a large quantity of frankincense, everything in stock. She was baffled as to why anyone would need such a large amount. I shook my head at Miles and Bastion's unasked question. Before you ask, she couldn't describe the customer. My shop mentioned she also bought all the dried lavender in stock in addition to their entire stock of Dittany. Miles shook his head. Bastion, any thoughts about the quantity she's buying to beef up the ritual? Amplify it? That sounded not good. You two, need, you two need to explain what calling forth the dead means exactly. On the way, Bastion replied. Turning to Miles, he said, you're good? I think so. He stood without wobbling, proving his assertion true. He closed his eyes and touched his nose without hesitation, then stood on one foot without swaying like a drunk. Yep, I'm good. It was all a little too much like a sobriety test which meant he'd basically been drunk on that sleeping potion. He's not driving, right? Asked Bastion in a low voice. I'm standing right here, and no, I shouldn't drive. He gathered his laptop case, slipped on his shoes, and said, Ready, let's go. He wasn't fit to drive, but he was getting ready to... He was getting... Ready... To confront a murderer. Hmm. After locking his door, Miles slung an arm around my shoulders. As we followed Bastion back to his car, he said, So calling forth the dead. Usually, it's about reaching beyond the veil and communicating with the recently dead. Sometimes it's about bringing that spirit, spirit back for a chat. Completely forbidden, Bastion said as he clicked his key fob and unlocked the cross track. For a variety of reasons, not the least of which is disturbing a sleeping spirit and opening up a channel for less friendly beings to cross over. Less friendly beings? I stutter stepped. Miles squeezed my shoulder, studying me. Less friendly beings were bad enough, but what did it mean that Hannah was going big with her ingredients? Okay, chapter 14. Um, I am drinking iced tea um, because of my oral surgery. I'm not allowed to, well, I don't know about allowed, but I should not be drinking hot liquids or alcohol. Um, so I am rediscovering my southern roots, and um, I love iced tea, so it works out great. All right, chapter 14. Bastion, Miles, and I weren't headed to the cemetery, thank goodness. Not yet, at least. So I had a little time to mentally prepare. I was going with that plan, and not the plan where I focused on how scary Hannah and her spirit buddies, physical and otherwise, might be. I liked my sanity, and I liked to at least pretend that I was brave. First, we stopped at Magic Beans to collect the troops and formulate a plan per Bastion. We entered through the front to collect Bethann. She needed to be let into the office. Whatever magical security Bastion had on the door didn't account for Bethann's sudden return to the coffee shop. Bethann was behind the counter with a strawberry blonde barista I hadn't met yet. His name tag read Jonathan. He lifted a hand in greeting as he steamed milk. Jonathan didn't look like the world was about to end, so either he didn't know what was happening or I was potentially overreacting. Bethann joined us as we marched toward the back of Magic Beans to the office. The four of us got a few odd looks from the patrons, but again... No one looked like the apocalypse was imminent, so maybe everything would be just fine. Once we'd all filed into Bastion's office and the door was firmly closed firmly behind us, Bethann let loose with a string of profanity. I blinked at her in shock. She was so chipper and upbeat. Except now. I'm going to kill her, Bethann said. Chop her up into little pieces and use her as fertilizer in my garden. Bethann, stop it. Bastion scowled at her. You're upsetting Lena. Hands on hips, she replied, yeah, well, that stupid witch Hannah is upsetting me, so what are you going to do about that? The exterior door of the office opened, and Sabrina stepped in with a bag, cloth bag clutched in her hand. Sorry I'm late. I was fetching a bunch of stuff from Bethann's house, so, whoa, everything okay? She looked around the group of us and settled on Bethann. No, Bethann snapped, not at all, but then she accepted the bag from Sabrina with a quiet thanks. 
I know that we need a plan, Bethann said as she poked around inside her bag, but it would also be better if we got there before she starts. She dug out two small velvet pouches and proceeded to hand out the contents, two stones, one from each to everyone in the room. Sabrina, Miles, and Fashion pocketed them without question. I looked at the two black stones in my hand and said, um, what am I supposed to do with these? Just put them in your pocket, Bethann replied. They might help. The stones felt cool in my hand. They didn't feel special. It seemed to have any sort of woo-woo properties that I could identify. Help with what? Bethann pulled her attention away from the contents of her bag and looked at me with a curious expression. Sabrina patted my back. She's a sleeper. No education. Recently joined the community. Information I was certain the entire magical community would know by now, given how small Bastion claimed the group to be, but it seemed the local representatives of the ICWP knew how to keep investigations under their hat. Ah, they're Shungite and Jet. Stash them in a pocket. You'll know if you need them. As for what they'll help with, she peered at me, then smiled. We're going to a cemetery. I'll let you use your best judgment. So, a plan? Miles directed this question at Bethann, not Bastion. What are you thinking? She lifted her bag. I have a few goodies in here, but our best plan is to beat her there and prevent the ritual, so let's get a move on. If we get there and she's already started to set up, we need to destroy any ritual preparations she's made. Bethann looked at me. Not if she's completed the circle, though, newbie. Let someone else handle that. Actually, she turned to Bastion, who moved over to his bookshelf and was perusing his stash of leather-bound, locked journals. Maybe it's best if the baby witch skipped this one. Bastion pulled one from the shelf and tucked it under his arm. Not everything fit into those cargo pants of his. Not an option. Hannah is likely using Lena's magic, in part, to power the ritual. Bethann's eyes grew round. Oh, she blinked. Right. It'll be a tight fit in the cross truck, so no worries, Bastion. I've got the dogmobile today, Sabrina said. We'll take mine. Which was how the five of us ended up in an older black suburban that smelled faintly of dog. The seats had been laid flat, leaving enough room for a, for a pack of large dogs. After we'd popped them up and settled ourselves, I asked, exactly how many dogs does one have to need this large of a vehicle? Sabrina snorted as she drove. You haven't heard yet? I'm the resident crazy dog lady. I hadn't grown up with pets, and by the time I realized I might want one, I was well into my professional candy-making phase. In the early days, I had worked out of my home, so it hadn't seemed like a good idea to have a cat. They get into everything, walk on everything, weren't in any way controllable from what I could tell, and a dog seemed awfully difficult. All that training... Long story short, I hadn't a clue what a crazy dog lady was, only that I wasn't one. Since you're too polite to ask, Sabrina said, three German shorthaired pointers that run the show and a visiting foster dog whenever I'm not too consumed with work for an extra project. Four dogs. That seemed like an awful lot. Oops. That seemed like an awful lot of hair and drool and movement and hair. I was in the back seat, which would have been protected from all the dog funk since it had been laid flat, but it seemed clean enough. Other than the hint of dogginess I'd smelled when the first door when the door first opened, her car was as clean as mine. <laughs> Sabrina dressed like someone who would um, who would mind dog hair. The perfectly smooth waves of dark hair, the expertly applied makeup, the cute jeans with even cuter tops. Maybe my understanding of dogs wasn't quite right. Your silence speaks volumes. There was a hint of a smile in Miles' voice. She doesn't seem the type, right? Uh... Sabrina chuckled. It's okay. I get it. I get my car cleaned by the one place in town I found that can get the prickly short hairs out of the carpet. Leather seats help. And I carry a lint roller with me everywhere. She caught my glance in the mirror and winked. I hide my crazy well. But speaking of crazy, anyone want to clue me and Bethann in as to how the quiet new girl turned out to be a serial killer? Miles grunted. She's not a serial killer. Not that much of an idiot. Oh, I'm not blaming you, Miles. I'd have hired her in a heartbeat. She makes a mean latte, and from the look of bliss on the boss's face every time he takes a sip of her coffee, she does a plain black pretty well, too. What kind of car are we looking for? Bethann asked. We were within view of the cemetery, and we'd spent the entire ride talking dogs and coffee and not a moment discussing strategy. I hadn't a clue what this ritual was or how we were to destroy any preparations for it. Oh, yes, I did know that I wasn't to disturb a circle if it was complete. Um, see, at least Bastion had been productive. He'd been in the front seat ignoring us and reading his journal. An old pickup truck, single cab, dark blue. Bastion pointed as we drove into the lot. There. Of course she'd arrived before us. We'd had to wake Miles, then get him sober enough to talk through what Hannah's next steps might be, then confirm that information, then gather supplies. Good grief. 
There better not be a pissed off zombie mama in the cemetery already. You're sure she can't complete the ritual before sunset? Let's see, it's a typo. Bethan replied, she can't even start it until sunset, but I bet she's already set up a protection circle and incorporated the necessary ingredients. She nudged me in the ribs. Don't mess with the circle, newbie. Yeah, I got that part. I patted the stones in my pocket, hoping they'd do their job and help me with whatever lay ahead. We piled out of Sabrina's Suburban, Bethan with her bag of goodies, and Bastion with his book. Whoa. Or not with his book. Did you just stash a full-size journal in your cargo pants? Bastion frowned like he didn't understand the question. Oh yeah, he definitely did. Sabrina shot me a cheery smile. Magic pockets. You didn't think he was wearing those as a fashion statement, did you? Although, you know, Bastion just might. And F, the pants are off limits. I had to swallow a giggle, which then made me sound like I was choking. When Miles asked if I was okay, I nodded. What could I say? That my dirty mind was sad that Bastion pan Bastion's pants were off limits? And that inappropriately timed lust asserted itself as humor? And because that's just how weird I could be sometimes? Hard pass. The nod would have to do. We were steadily approaching the cemetery gates, and it occurred to me that my brain worked in weird and wondrous ways. I'd been hyper-focusing on anything and everything but the creepiness that lay beyond those gates. Thank you, brain, for the distraction, but now I needed to be front and center. Then I saw the sign announcing that visiting hours concluded at sunset. I pointed, um, we can't go in there. It's closed to the public after dark. Four sets of eyes looked at me with varying degrees of pity and concern. My brain was returning to reality, just slowly and in increments. I didn't blame it. It liked living. Maybe we should leave her in the car, Miles mumbled. We'll probably need her help, Bethan replied, since you're all pretty sure her wild magic is juicing Hannah's ritual. She shot a questioning glance at Bastion, and he replied, We're 90% certain. She needs to come with us. 90% was good. That meant there was a 10% chance that my magic wasn't about to be used to accomplish yet another evil deed. I'm good. Minor brain glitch. All good. I'm in. Not that they needed my reassurance. Feet were already in motion. Looked like we were going to crash a supernatural reunion. End of the chapter. Chapter 15. Does anyone know where the grave is? I whispered to four backs. The sidewalk we were following was wide enough for two, and I was bringing up the rear, all by my lonesome. I was good with that. Being the last one to arrive when approaching a murdering witch intent on calling forth the dead seemed like the best of a bad situation. The fire's your first clue, Bethann replied. As obvious as fire anywhere in a cemetery should have been, she didn't sound at all snarky. Unlike Sabrina... Yeah, witching 101, fire, water, earth, air, all important in the big rituals. But mostly fire, because it's highly visible in the dark, especially in a wide-open public area. Then she winked at me. It's the nerves. Stick with the ICWP, and you'll be over those in a flash. Uh, no. I didn't see a future where I didn't have a case of nerves in a dangerous situation. Nerves served a vital function. Fear was a mechanism of self-preservation, and I liked living. A tiny flicker of light was joined by another, and then another, Three flickering flames were now ahead and slightly to the right of us, flames that surely indicated Hannah's location and the diminishing light of the cemetery. Okay, fine, I whispered. I see them. Hard to miss, right? Sabrina said. Don't worry, we'll get you hooked up with your family's mentor and properly trained in no time. After Hannah's taken care of, I muttered, and my future well outside the confines of a witch jail had been assured. Not that I truly believed any longer that Bastion would let that happen. Naturally, Sabrina agreed. She slowed and fell, fell into step next to me. You're mostly here as an observer. We just need you present. Right, Bastion? Bastion grumbled something that might have been agreement, then he began mumbling words I didn't understand. Trust me, you'll be fine. Sabrina skipped ahead again. Bastion continued to mumble, in German if I had to guess, and we kept walking. Let's see, hold on. We kept walking, and then... 
The air crackled. It snapped and popped as if electricity ran through it. It's typo. Except it wasn't an electrical storm brewing. I knew it was magic. I could feel it in my fingers and my toes. My scalp prickled. The hair on the back of my neck stood at attention and my entire body shivered. Not in fear, because this was Bastion's magic, not Hannah's. I'm not sure how I knew, just that in my gut, or whatever passed as an intuitive organ for a witch, I was certain. I'd paused, awestruck by the intimate feel of Bastion's power washing over my entire body, which meant my merry band of magic friends was leaving me behind. Hurrying to catch up, I returned to the group just as they began to link hands. First Beth Ann and Miles, then Miles and Sabrina, and finally Sabrina reached out and clasped my fingers. Bastion remained alone, untouched, leading us to Hannah. We moved off the path toward a grave, to the edge of the protective circle Hannah had created around her mother's final place of rest. It appeared to be made of herbs, flowers, and rock salt. There were four lit candles, the source of the flickering flames we'd all spotted, spread equidistant around the circle. There were other items as well that I didn't take the time to study. Coming near the edge, coming near the edge of that circle, I was reminded that we weren't to disturb it. How then could we destroy the ritual preparations if they were inside the not-to-be-touched circle? But I had no time to dwell on the question because two, happen two things happened almost at the same time. Bethan grasped my hand, bringing our group minus Bastion into a circle. A buzz of awareness traveled through me, different from the feel of Bastion's power, but with the same electric zing, magic. And I made eye contact with Hannah for the first time. As our gazes locked, I had the oddest sensation of familiarity, almost like deja vu, except deeply unpleasant. The familiarity I sensed wasn't one of place or situation. It was the familiarity of person. It was like catching sight of myself in a mirror out of the corner of my eye. There was an instant, unexpected recognition of a human who wasn't me, and yet at the same time was me. When I looked into her eyes, I saw a distorted image of myself, and I also saw what she'd done, every bit of it. In her eyes, I saw that she'd used my magic to kill someone. This woman was no mouse, not even close. She was a vengeful murderer. Lena, she acknowledged me, but none of the others. I felt Bethann and Sabrina's fingers squeeze reassuringly around my own. You're too late. She stood inside her protective circle, unruffled by the zip and zing of Bastion's magic. No small feat, because he'd whipped it into such a frenzy that it moved the very air. Puffs of magic filled air, tw um, puffs of magic filled air twisted through the cemetery, brushing my face and fluttering through my hair. I don't see the departed Mrs. Bitters, Sabrina said. Do you guys? Miles and Bethann agreed that she wasn't present, each replying in a normal conversation replying in normal conversational tones. Basham was still mumbling low words in a foreign tongue, but he watched Hannah in our small circle with a keen eye. Yeah, I think that means we're not too late. Flippin' as her words were, Sabrina's hand clung tightly to mine. Bethann spoke next, addressing Hannah as if lecturing a child. There's a reason we don't reach beyond the physical world with our magic, Hannah. It's wrong to disturb the dead in their eternal sleep. And if I want to disturb her, Hannah asked, if she doesn't deserve to sleep peacefully? Wow. So we were doing this. She was actually going to talk to us about her mother and her murderous motivations. That was surprising. Or was it? For all I knew, that was normal criminal behavior. Maybe <coughs> feeling... Me Memphis. Maybe feeling unheard or mis <coughs> misunderstood. Maybe feeling unheard or misunderstood had spurred her to kill. Or maybe she was just a terrible person who thought it was okay to extinguish life in her pursuit of revenge. Every spirit deserves rest, Miles chimed in. As he spoke, Bastion shifted closer to the circle. With a flickering gesture, he pushed that magical wind of his to extinguish one of the four flames. Hannah frowned, and as she turned, I shouted, Why my magic? Because I'd realized that we were the decoy. I hadn't a clue if that had always been the plan, or if the group had ad-libbed when, when they'd seen what was waiting for us. But I at least... Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Uh, but at least I knew what was happening now. She snorted. Where did you come from, Lena Dorchester? Have you been living under a rock? I asked her that too, Sabrina nodded, as if the crazy person's question was legitimate. I frowned at both of them. No, I didn't know I was a witch. No one in my family did. Then you and your family are either willfully blind or unbelievably dense. She shook her head. All that raw magic and no one had a clue? I heaved out a dramatic sigh as Bastion extinguished yet another flame. Apparently so. And it's not like I cook up cursed candy on a daily basis. 
Bastion edged around the perimeter of the circle, and I was worried his movement would draw Hannah's eye, so I continued my ridiculous tale. It was my ex-boyfriend. He went on a text rant one night when I happened to be making those stupid cupcake toppers. He just kept texting me over and over again. At this point, I had everyone's attention, everyone but Bastion. He manipulated another puff of air to extinguish the third candle flame. And then what? Hannah arched an eyebrow. I've spread the raw magic from that one piece of candy over three potions. Did he show up at your house with a gun? Threaten to kill your cat? I'm sorry, what? What kind of people did this woman know? I don't have a cat. My ex doesn't own a gun. And I wouldn't date anyone who might show up on my doorstep threatening physical violence toward me or my pet. I think Hannah's point is that you created some seriously supercharged raw magic, Sabrina said, which is typically the result of very strong emotions. I was angry. He just kept texting, blaming me for our failed relationship. My business took too much of my time. We didn't have enough sex. Like, that was my issue. I didn't like his friends, who, by the way, were a bunch of 30-somethings who acted like juvenile delinquents. Is she for real? Hannah blinked in confusion. You've heard of, block of the blocking feature on your phone, right? I rolled my eyes. How had this developed into a criticism of my life choices? Oh, right. Distraction. The witches were the decoy while Bastion worked his wind-fluttering magic to extinguish the four flames, a task which he'd just completed. And that's when things got nasty. Hannah jerked as if a tether attached to the core of her body had been yanked, and then she screamed. If witches got their power from emotion, maybe now was the time to be scared of the power Hannah had because she was livid. She shoved with both hands, fingers spread wide, and before I could even think what that might mean, she'd pushed our small circle apart. Our hands were wrenched from each other's grasp. I fell to the ground on my hands and knees, though the others managed to remain standing. Focus, Bastion, Miles said. He wasn't looking at Bastion. His attention was on me as he helped me to my feet. I glanced at our wizard to see what exactly he was up to, and I found him tackling the circle. He was wrestling with a plant. Literally. The leaves seemed to be alive and wrapping around his hands and forearms. Bethan was digging through her bag of goodies, and Sabrina was... Wow. I don't think I've ever seen a cat fight in person. I gaped at the two hair-pulling, wrestling women as Miles brushed me off. I waved him away. I'm fine. We should help her. Bad idea. She's just keeping her distracted while Beth Ann works some counter magic and Bastion deconstructs the circle. I blinked at him, and you're, he grinned, keeping an eye on you. We outnumber her five to one. We've got this. Okay. Except I wasn't nearly as confident as Miles. With good reason. A mass of wind, nothing like the puffs of wind Bastion's frenzied magic had created, gusted through the cemetery. The air groaned. It moaned in distress. But then again, maybe it wasn't the air. Maybe it was the vacant-eyed woman leaning against the late Rachel Bitter's gravestone. A spirit can't cross over if the circle's been taken apart, right? I looked at Miles, hoping he'd tell me that wasn't the corporeal spirit of Rachel Bitter's propped against her own headstone. Miles let loose a profanity. End of chapter. Chapter 16. Bethan appeared at my elbow and tried to tug me closer to the circle. I dug my heels in and shook my head, because closer to the circle was closer to the moaning dead woman. Bethan turned to face me and grasped my upper arms, then leaned close. Time to put your big girl panties on. You need to help Bastion and me handle this. Bethan tugged again, and again I resisted. Tipping her head in the direction of the not-to-be-touched circle, she said, Over there. I frowned. I thought I wasn't supposed to disturb the circle. That was then. She squeezed my arms, whether to reassure whether to reassure me or snap me out of a fog of shock, I didn't know. This is now. I wasn't convinced. Rachel Bitter's gaze caught mine, and I realized I'd incorrectly assumed her stare was vacant. Unfixed? Yes. Vacant implied that no one was home, and I saw intelligence there. She might be staring off into the distance, but this was a woman in pain. Unsettled, set adrift in a world where she no longer belonged, trapped in a body that anchored her to a place she shouldn't be. That's when I follow Beth Ann closer to the circle and the woman who needed our help. Rachel Bitters needed to be set free. 
whatever her choices in life, however, however she treated her daughter during her lifetime, in death she deserved peace, a peace that I now realized her daughter had intended to take from her. Ashton had managed to wrangle the plant into submission. The plant had been dumped from its pot and its roots exposed, but he wasn't tackling the other objects that had been incorporated into the circle. An arrow and a silver bowl filled with blue stones and some liquid. Bastion abandoned the circle. What was the point in lingering? Rachel had already been called forth and rushed to aid Sabrina. My mouth dropped open, but words eluded me. Sabrina, five foot nothing and hardly what I'd have called scrappy before today, knelt atop a subdued Hannah. Sabrina's makeup had survived the brawl and her hair barely looked must. Hannah, however, lay prone, prone on the ground, her hands twisted behind her back looking much the worse for wear. Oops, much worse for wear. Bastion swooped in with a pair of cuffs. His lips moved as he spoke words I couldn't hear. The cuffs didn't glow or sparkle, but I could feel the magical energy he was calling moving into them. Sabrina had won her cat fight, and now with Bastion's help and his cuffs, Hannah appeared to be restrained. Sabrina and Bastion helped her stand, which was when I realized how freakishly, eerily passive our suspect was. She stood, unmoving, her hands behind her back, her posture rigid, her posture was rigid, but she didn't struggle. Her eyes flashed defiance, but her body remained still. Miles whispered in my ear, magic to cuffs. They'll keep Hannah quiet for a little while, hopefully long enough to take care of her. He indicated the corporeal spirit who was still moaning, then squeezed my arm and slipped away. He took what had been Bastion's place next to Hannah. Hannah now stood with Sabrina on one side and Miles on the other, and Bastion, he'd managed to disappear into the wind leaving me and Bethan in a bag of herbs and crystals to hand, handle our outstanding problem. What do you need me to do, I asked, eyeing the woman who looked like a pale, haunted version of the Rachel Bitters I'd seen in photos. By this point, my fear of the embodiment of Rachel's spirit had diminished. We were easily within six feet of her, and she hadn't moved. She hadn't threatened us or even looked at us. She stared into space and expressed her agony in the only way it seemed she could, with pitiful sounds. It made me sick that her own family had done this to her. Bethan inched forward until her toes were as close to Hannah's circle of salt and herbs and flowers as they could get without touching it. What we do is make our own circle. I eyed the curving line of strewn ingredients in the grass as I approached. Like Bethan, I got as close as I could to the edge without touching it. Wait, I leaned down, compelled to reach out. My fingers were inches from the ground when Bethan grabbed my arm and yanked me upright. Don't touch. I looked at Bethan and then the materials that made up the circle. That's my magic. Don't tell me how I know, but I do. She mixed in some of my cupcake topper with the rock salt and the sugar and all that other stuff. Sugar? Bethann squinted at the mixture on the ground and then growled. She customized the circle to your magic. Hannah was a murdering witch and had a deep desire to call forth fire ants along with her dead mother. Except Idaho didn't have fire ants, so maybe Bethann was right. And all that sugar had something to do with Hannah co-opting my magic. Bethann reached toward the edge of the protective circle, but as soon as her fingers got within a few inches, she yanked her hand back. She tried again with the same result. Oh, good grief. She blew on her pink fingers. You have to do this. There's some strong cursing in the magic she borrowed from you. Right. What do I do? Bastion appeared as if from the air and replied, you sweep. What? I didn't understand that at all. One, no broom. Two, what did cleanliness have to do with protection circles? Three, Bastion cut short my mental list as he explained his reasoning. Directing his comment to Beth Ann, he said, she cut away the sleeping spell on Miles with an actual knife earlier. Work with it. Bastion had moved to stand just outside the circle, very near Rachel Bitters. He began murmuring in a, in a foreign tongue. His voice was low and soothing, his words flowing so smoothly it was almost as if he sang. And Rachel listened. She quieted, her moans softening and then dying. Only the sound of Bastion's words could be heard in the quiet of the cemetery now. Right. Pay attention, Beth Ann said sharply. You're sweeping away bad energy. I don't have a broom. The words sounded as idiotic out loud as they had in my head. She muttered something derogatory about baby witches under her breath. It's a metaphor, Lena. Bastion continued his almost lullaby, thank goodness, because without the background noise of Rachel's lament, my brain was starting to function properly again. I didn't actually need the knife to cut the spell. I just had to think really hard about cutting and imagine it. I could do this. It's more complicated than, you know what? Sure, 
You're sweeping bad juju away. I looked at the trail of dried ingredients and that stuff. Yes, she nodded, and that stuff. If it burns, stop. Got it. I didn't have it. Why had she mentioned burning? Thought about sweeping, but then my brain wanted to know if I was using my fingers to actually sweep the material away or if this effort was 100% metaphorical and I was waving my hands around. Since I'd actually planned to cut miles and then hadn't needed to, I decided it was best to call this a truly physical act. Okay, just sweep the debris. Let's see. Typo. Okay, I thought about sweeping and I reached out. No heat. So I brushed an opening in the circle. It was all rather anticlimactic. The material simply scattered under my hand. A little of the sugar stuck to my hands. Was it any shock my hands were a little damp? I was nervous as heck. Give me a break. Bethan flashed a bemused smile. Okay then. Good job, newbie. Now let's go. She stepped inside the circle, closer to Rachel. Since she didn't go up in flames or look bothered at all about crossing the line, I figured the circle was now defunct. Though Bastion and through Bastion and my combined efforts, I was sure because I know I hadn't done it alone. I followed her over the defunct line in the grass. I followed her closer to the passive Rachel, but then she grabbed Rachel's hand, her dead hand. Hurry up. The longer she's here, the harder she is to send back. I dithered because dead person? Dead person's hand? Touching a dead person's hand. I shivered from the tips of my toes to the ends of my fingertips. Is that safe? I whispered, as if Rachel might not hear me if I spoke quietly. It wasn't clear if the woman understand, understood anything happening around her, with the exception of Bastion's quiet, persistent patter. Sure, her response was flippant, which gave me pause. She scowled. Probably. Maybe. It's the only way I noticed in her back. I looked to Bastion for reassurance, but he offered me none. His look was grim, and he couldn't exactly reply since his words were the only thing keeping Rachel calm. Rachel. Hmm. Hold on. Okay. Um, I tried to catch Rachel's gaze, but she was entranced by Bastion and his words. He'd captivated her, but it was only temporary. I remembered the look of pain in her eyes before. Before I could change my mind, I clasped her hand. And I was suddenly so very, very cold. Rachel's claw-like fingers clutched at mine, and the ice that was hers became mine. First my fingers, then my palm, my arm. On some level, I realized this might be a bad outcome. My other hand was clasped by Bethan, and for a moment, I felt a tiny prick of warmth. But then it was gone, swallowed by the cold. Cold that had moved to my shoulder, my neck, my lungs. It ached to take a breath, and each exhalation pushed icy air through my body. I tried to blink, but even my eyeballs hurt as the frigid bite settled in there as well. Movement in my peripheral vision clarified as Miles and then Sabrina joined our small circle. With each addition, I felt a Chapter 17. When your final thoughts, moments before death, are of your business and not your loved ones, that might be a sign. A sign that you needed to get a life. A sign that your life wasn't as fulfilled as you once believed. It might also be a sign that you're not on the cusp of death at all. On the heels of that revelation, I felt the warm sensation of Bastion's hand encircling my own. It was such a nice, pleasant, cozy, ow! All of a sudden, feeling returned to my body, and ow, hurt everywhere. Felt like I'd been hit by a bus or a linebacker. Hey, she said something. Sabrina's word, worried voice came to me from out of the darkness. Someone smacked my cheek, which prompted another expression of pain, this one more colorful than the last. Why isn't she opening her eyes? Miles asked. Do you think she has brain damage? Since I hadn't a clue my eyes were closed, I now made the effort to lift heavy, my heavy lids. Yes, they ached too, and a few salient facts were revealed. I was lying on my back on the hard ground. Landing there might explain some of the aches I was currently experiencing. Miles, Sabrina, Beth Ann, and Bastion were all looming over me, which indicated they, unlike me, hadn't suffered a fall. Finally, Rachel was conspicuously absent from my view. I'm not brain damaged. I propped myself up on my elbows. Not any more than before. Bastion cleared his throat. Glad to hear it. His voice sounded funny. Rachel? I asked. Sit back beyond the veil where she can rest in peace. Beth Ann looked a little pale, even for a redhead. There was quite a moon out tonight, so maybe it was just the effect of the moonlight. 
I pushed myself up to a sitting position. And Hannah? Tied to a tree, Sabrina replied. I better go check on her. Actually, Miles, Bethan, why don't you come with me? Just in case she decides to try and make a break for it. That seemed unlikely, given the last I'd seen of her. She was hardly able to move. Then again, Bastion's magicking of her cuffs wouldn't last forever, so maybe they had a point. Any chance you want to give me a hand up? I stretched out a hand. Bastion ignored it and sat on the ground next to me. Maybe give yourself a minute. I feel fine, really. Not really, since the feeling of being rushed by a pro football player was only slowly fading. Since you just came as close to crossing over to the other side as any living person in my experience, trust me when I say you should give yourself a minute. Crossing over? Wait, a living person can cross over? No. His abrupt, almost harsh response had an unusual effect. I chuckled. I couldn't help remembering my thoughts as I'd quite possibly edged toward death. I'd been worried about sticky turkey treats, which was ludicrous. Laughably so. Glad you find this amusing. It wasn't entertaining to watch. I didn't... He scrubbed a hand across his face. This should never have happened. Rachel shouldn't have been called after, after we began deconstructing the physical component of her ritual. Speaking of, I don't understand how you managed to flit around Hannah's protection circle unnoticed and blow out four candles, even with the help of our distracting chatter. I didn't flit. I walked on two legs, aided by an incantation an incantation. It stirred confusion and created a cover to conceal my actions. Oh, so what you're saying is our distracting chatter wasn't an essential component. It was extremely helpful. There was a smile in his voice now. Uh, there was a smile in his voice now that we weren't talking about my near-death experience. Good to know we weren't totally useless. By the way, how was Hannah able to, to call Rachel from the other side? Because I know you got those flames exten extinguished before sunset. Bethan thinks maybe the call had already been made and the fall of sunset was the last component. So when we interrupted the ritual, even though it was before sunset, it was too late. He cleared his throat. I just wanted to say, I wouldn't have brought you if I'd known it was going to be so dangerous. I glanced at him, surprised. I thought you needed me here because Hannah was using my magic. Turned out we did. We likely wouldn't have been able to make the link with Rachel that we needed to in order to send her back. didn't escape my attention that he'd failed to address the inconsistency, needing me present and regretting including me. Best not to mention it, since he wasn't keen on addressing it. So I asked a question that now weighed on me. Did she make it back? Is Rachel at peace again? As much as she ever was. When I stared hard at him, because that was no answer at all, he added, we don't know much about what lies beyond the veil, but she's been released from this place. I shivered. She didn't belong here, and I think it caused her pain real physical pain to be here. It did. He removed his jacket and wrapped it around me. I was enveloped by the scent of Christmas and cuddles. He spoke with such assurance about Rachel's pain, and it had been his words that had soothed her. It didn't take a great leap for me to draw a conclusion. That's what your lullaby did, wasn't it? You took her pain away with your words. He smiled. He, oops, sorry. He blinked and then smiled. My lullaby. Well, it was in some foreign tongue, so I can't attest to the content, but it had a rolling, calming rhythm that reminded me of a lullaby, or maybe a soothing chant. It was an incantation to help ease her suffering. A light went off in my head. That's what's in the journals. And probably why there was decent security in his office, now that I thought about it. Yes. I nudged him with my shoulder. Wizards versus witches, the head versus the heart. Really, the difference is that you're a big research nerd and like to do magic homework. He chuckled, sure. Not that witches didn't have their own brand of homework. Potions that were prepared in advance for one, research for, research for rituals, as tonight's adventure had proven. Were witches and wizards really all that different? Are you feeling up to the walk back to the parking lot? I nodded. I'd been fine five minutes ago. Sore, but not... Um, but certainly, oops, typo. Sore, but certainly capable of walking. But I was glad for the brief interlude before facing the rest of the gang. As he stood, I removed his jacket. I returned it, then extended my hand. With great efficiency and not a bit of lingering, he helped me to my feet. And he definitely didn't try to brush me off as Miles had done. He eyed me critically. You're sure you're fine? 
Yeah, Sabrina said as she approached. I gagged Hannah, grasped firmly in one hand. It's not every day that you come within a few feet of death. Feet, Beth Ann said incredulously. Try inches. Just be glad Bastion isn't so uptight about wizard rules that he wouldn't join our circle. Bastion had broken a wizard rule to help me? Shut it, Beth Ann, Miles said. We agreed not to mention the unmentionable thing that could get Bastion in trouble with his gran. Beth Ann made a disgruntled noise. Anyone get her promise on that? She indicated the cuffed and gagged prisoner. Who's going to believe her if she does talk? Miles shot Hannah an evil look. Why is she gagged? I asked as we followed the path back to our car. Later, I'd ask how she'd avoided detection, how we'd avoided detection by the non-magical security that the, the cemetery surely had in place. <clears throat> she kept on and on about the wrongs done her in her childhood and how the world was against her. Miles shrugged. She was pushing Sabrina's button, so I thought it was best to keep her quiet. Good thing, too, Sabrina said with a vicious look pointed at the woman she was none too gently dragging behind her. If I had to hear any more about how it was so terrible to be raised by an older cousin, a woman who took her in and clearly adored her, or how her life was ruined by her father and his second wife, people she'd never even met, by the way, then I could not be held responsible for my actions. Wow, someone had some strong feelings. Don't ask, Miles mumbled quietly. But not quietly enough, because Sabrina replied, Really, Miles? Because you think it's just fine to blame other people for your vicious, revenge-seeking, murderous actions. Uh, no. I don't have any vicious, revenge-seeking, murderous, murderous actions. Exactly. Sabrina's rant might not make complete sense, but the gist of it, that one is ultimately responsible for one's own actions, was fairly clear. It made me wonder about her own background. Who was she trying so hard not to blame, or what had she moved past? I filed those questions away for a later day, a day when I hadn't watched a murderer get taken down on a chair and a sips hair pulling, and a hair pulling fingernail scratching cat fight, a day when I hadn't met a ghost, a day when I hadn't come per Bethan within inches of death. You know what? I said as I climbed into the suburban's third row seating, I think I'm taking tomorrow off, shutting the shop, calling it a family emergency or something, but definitely taking the day completely off. Sabrina, who along with Miles had maneuvered Hannah into the second row seating, said, No need to shut the shop down. I'll babysit another day. She grinned over her shoulder. I love your shop. Besides, I could use another day to finish up my overhaul of your online ordering system. I ignored the twinge of unease her words inspired and accepted her gesture for exactly what it was, a kindness. Thank you, Sabrina. Chapter 18. Monday morning, two days later, I was having some very mixed feelings about letting Sabrina get her hands on my online ordering system. She'd revamped it all right. She'd even left me with a reference binder. After flipping through, after flipping through it, it seemed that it was even simpler than the system I had in place before. But then I'd retrieved the orders for the day. I had so many orders that my stock would be completely wiped out if I didn't get cracking cooking up candy every night well into the wee hours for the rest of the week. Which was amazing, but also... Wow. I wanted to thank her and then strangle her. And both of those feelings warred with each other right up until noon when she appeared in the store. Hey, uh, she said as she breezed in, walking behind the counter and put an apron on. Um, hi? To the best of my knowledge, Sabrina's tenure at Sticky Tricky Treats was over. Look at you. You've already printed the orders out. She smiled, quite rightly proud of herself. What exactly did you do to my ordering system? You didn't, she looked around the shop, checking to ensure no patrons were near. You didn't use magic to boost my visibility, did you? She laughed. It was a bright, sparkling sound. The first genuine, snark-free laugh I'd heard from her. No, I did not. There's no magic required when you have skills. And you have skills. I do, she agreed. I figured you'd want some help filling online orders for the foreseeable future, now that your sales will be tripling. Oh, and since you're losing Lucy. Wait, what? Tripled sales? Losing Lucy? Yeah, she's put off telling you because she adores you and working at the shop and didn't want to let you down, but she put her hands on her hips. You do realize that students graduate, right? But Lucy doesn't graduate until May. I was pretty sure that was right. Not that I'd asked, because asking meant facing the reality of losing my dependable, friendly, affordable help. And I liked Lucy. Working with her was fun. 
A concerned look crossed Sabrina's face. She graduates in December, Alina, and she really didn't have time to work here this fall, but she didn't want to let you down. I covered my face with my hands. I was the worst boss ever. When I looked up, I saw sympathy plastered across Sabrina's face. I'll call her today and tell her not to come in for her next shift, and I'll start looking for someone right away. I glanced at the pages of orders I'd printed out. Maybe two part-time employees, or even a full-time person. No, nah, you've got me. She didn't give me a chance to argue or ask questions. I like the hours here better than magic beans, and Miles has always been desperate to take over as head barista. I'll still work for Bastion a few evenings a week and as a fill-in. A lightness filled me. I'd known in the back of my head that Lucy was a temporary solution to a long-term problem. Ideally, I'd have hired someone who was more committed to the business, and it didn't get much more committed than overhauling my entire online ordering system. All right, then. Let's get to work. Your little revamp has put a massive dent in my stock, so we're going to get so we're going to be busy for the next few days. I lifted a hand for a high five. I expected an eye roll in return, which I got, but she didn't leave me hanging. Four hours later, with the shelves looking much thinner, the online orders from the weekend were filled. Sabrina hustled out the door, saying she still had a shift at Magic Beans this evening. I expected a short burst of foot traffic, but nothing I couldn't easily handle alone, so I waved her cheerily on her way. A few more hours and I could close the shop, and then make more candy. And also call Bryson. The boost I'd felt from filling STT's large queue of online orders faded a little bit. I really should have called him on Saturday, but I'd been taking a vacay from life. A much-deserved one, if I did say so myself. I stopped fiddling with the display near the door when the jingle of bells alerted me to the first customer of the early evening rush. I cut short my standard greeting as I saw who'd step through the door. Bastion, hello. A, wild, a wide smile bloomed. I guess I was happy to see him. Hi. He looked a little nervous. You're not here to arrest me, are you? I was kidding, but then again, he did look a little jumpy. No, of course not. I was just... I thought you might like to know that everything with Hannah has been finalized. My eyebrows flew up in surprise. Finalized? How? She's been processed and transferred to ICWP's Seattle branch. They're better equipped to house serious criminals pending trial than we are. Oh, that's a relief. Just having her out of town. He nodded. He examined me, looking for something. You're doing all right? Yeah, fine, thanks which was when I remembered that I'd stolen one of his employees, one of his best employees. Oh, Sabrina, did she tell you she's going to work here? Yes, that's no problem. He waved a hand dismissively as if losing a barista with the much sought after feel was no big deal. I'm glad she'll be helping out here. The hours are better for her and she'll still be doing a little work at Magic Beans. I'm excited to have her. She's surprisingly good with customers, and she's already increased my online orders and, stream and streamlined the process on my end. My inventory automatically updates, and there's... I shook my head. The details aren't important. Let's just say she's made an amazing difference in a very short time. He grinned. Don't get used to it. She's incredibly productive when she has insomnia, but most of the time she's a little less like a superhero. It occurred to me as we chatted that I'd missed seeing him. That I'd miss seeing him. Without the excuse of an investigation, I wouldn't really have a reason, and he'd already made it clear what he thought of wizards and witches mingling socially. It made me sad, because Bastion was very much a man I'd like to get to know better. If I ask you a question, can you promise not to feed me the international criminal witch police party line? Okay, he squirmed, though I may not be able to answer at all. Uh-huh. So, would you really have charged me as an accessory to murder if I hadn't helped you? Probably not. Bastion, I gently chided. All right, truth? No, I wouldn't have. That would have been a gross miscarriage of justice. But I wasn't misrepresenting the possibility of that outcome. Technically, you could be charged as an accessory for providing the magical means of the murder. Uh-huh. So why did you do it? His cheeks pinked. Why did I do what? Twist my arm to help with the case. He remained stubbornly silent. I hadn't given it much thought until this very moment, but now that I did, it seemed almost obvious. You wanted to keep an eye on me to make sure I was safe, he shrugged. I was fairly sure I was at least partially correct, but I suspected that wasn't the whole story. He'd admitted that he'd placed magical protections on my shop and home. He could have done that and walked away in good conscience. Tell me. I thought, he cleared his throat, I thought if you helped find the killer, it might help you, um, the color in his cheeks increased. 
You thought I'd feel less guilty about facilitating a murder. He blinked. Maybe. Not that I think you're responsible. How could you be? You didn't even know magic existed. You sweet, sweet man. On impulse, I leaned forward and kissed him on the cheek. But then, up close and personal, with all the Christmas and cuddles scent, I couldn't help but go in for the hug. And chapter 19. Chapter 18 was a little bit short, and this one is two, so I can do two in one day. I'm really excited. This is the last chapter. Okay, chapter 19. I'm a witch. I leaned against my kitchen counter with my phone pressed to my ear as I waited for Bryson to reply. Bastion had explained that family weren't supposed to discuss magic unless all the participating parties were inside the witchy circle of trust. How did I know who was in that sacred circle? I was gambling that Bryson's frantic reaction to my vague inquiry about witches meant that he was. I'd waited until Monday evening to call him because I'd needed a few days off from life after my recent adventures in the witch world. He sighed. Yeah, I kind of figured when you started asking questions. Real subtle, by the way, he mimicked my voice. What do you think about witches, Bryson? His voice returned to its normal pitch. And then you left me hanging. Vicious, cuz. What was I supposed to say? Apparently, most witches are spotted in their teens, maybe early 20s at the latest. Because I'm a late bloomer, I've been running around with magic for who knows how long, breaking who knows how many rules. He chuckled. Kills you, doesn't it? You're such a little rule follower. But none of that explains why you dropped a text bomb and then went radio silent. I wasn't such a rule follower, except in comparison to him. I didn't mean to leave you hanging. There were extenuating circumstances. As I puttered around my kitchen, starting a batch of caramels I'd planned to make as a thank you for Bastion, I gave him an abbreviated recounting of the last few days, starting with the accidental unleashing of my cursed candies into the world and ending with the capture of Hannah and Rachel's return to the spirit world. You really know how to make a splash. I'm glad you're safe and not in jail. He paused, then in a quiet voice said, Tell me about this wizard Bastion. Rather than bristle... It was not a coincidence that of all the new friends I'd mentioned, he'd landed on Bastion, the only wizard and the only person I was attracted to. I shared all of the thoughts that had been bouncing around unhappily in my head since I'd seen him last. I was attracted to him, but he seemed to consider me completely off limits. He could be gruff, but mostly was kind, considerate, and generous. Occasionally a little uptight, but overall a warm, caring guy. When I was done, he said, you're completely into this guy. I'm not but I could be. I checked the temperature of my candy thermometer. Wouldn't do for it to get too hot. He sighed again. Here's the thing. Witches and wizards. Bastion explained that we don't mingle. Ah, that may be true in Europe, or maybe it was when Bastion was a kid. Didn't you say he's old like you? Cute. Just keep that up and you'll be getting no candy from me for your birthday. Since Bryson loved all things sweet and was usually on a strict diet, his birthday was one of his allowed cheat days, and I knew he'd be waiting for my package of treats. Hey now, let's not be hasty. They say 50 is the new 40. I'm in my 30s, you jerk. And Bastion is barely in his 40s. We're not that old. Much more seriously, he replied, No, but you're old enough to know that prejudice exists everywhere, and you're also old enough to know you should make your own judgments about people, not relying on outdated social mores to rule your life. If you like this guy, then get to know him. Wizards can be quirky, but they can be cool. Oh, are you being supportive of my dating life? Because usually, Bryson liked to think of me as the Virgin Mary, untouched and untouchable, forever pure. That's how it seemed to me, since he'd been hypercritical of every man I'd ever dated. You deserve a good guy, and I think this Bastion might be okay. A little bit of a typo here. Fix that. I laughed as I turned off the burner on my stove. You know that from the little I've said about him. Yeah, I do. But don't worry, I'll be asking around about him. If there's any dirt, I'm sure I'll dig it up. And I'll try to make it out to Boise on my next break. Since Bryson's schedule was crazy, I figured I had until the end of hockey season before he showed up on my doorstep. But then Bastion and I probably wouldn't even be talking. Oops. By then, Bastion and I probably wouldn't even be talking. He was busy catching... Busy catching criminals and running a coffee shop. I was busy keeping sticky, tricky treats in the black. Um, cuz, don't you think it's time we talked about the elephant in the room? We'd covered my irregular introduction to magic, the resolution of my first major uh, magical blunder, and the new friends I'd made in the magical community. What was left? Um, great Aunt Sophia. Oh, no. I lifted a hand to cover my eyes. She's our family mentor. She's the one who's supposed to do my training. 
She is, Bryson agreed, much too cheerfully. I suffered through her crazy, and now it's your turn. There is no possible way that I can leave town. It's October. That's my biggest month, Bryson. I run a Halloween-themed candy store, for goodness sake. Which is hilarious, and you're finally in on the joke. Which with a Halloween candy shop? He snort laughed. Ha ha, seriously, I can't leave. And even once October is over, November, December, and early January are huge months for me. People eat and gift a lot of chocolate over the holidays. Right, I get that. I do actually pay attention when you wax poetic over STT, even when you go on and on about accounts payable and marketing and online sales. You do not. I do. Anyway, he said, a note of satisfaction entering his voice, you're just going to have to invite our darling great aunt for a visit. No. But all of my whining didn't change the reality of my situation. Crazy great aunt, great aunt Sophia would have to be invited, and knowing her, she'd come. I thought becoming a witch made my life complicated, while well, my life path had just taken a hard left into the land of rabid eccentricity.